My name is Carol Wyant, and I'm Executive Director of the Form-Based Codes Institute. The mission of the Form-Based Codes Institute is to uh, promote the use of form-based coding and to uphold standards for form-based coding to build upon uh, the age, the, the ancient and continuing uh, t forms of old urbanism. I would like to introduce, we have a very special guest today. Uh, you've heard that, you, you know these are the Driehaus Form-Based Codes Awards. The Driehaus Charitable Lead Trust uh, has been supporting and promoting these codes from the beginning and from the outset. And Richard Driehaus, who is the, uh, the founder of the Driehaus Form-Based Codes, uh, or, or of, of Driehaus Capital Management, and has been the, the patron of the Form-Based Codes Institute since its inception, is here today. And I'd like to invite Richard to come up and say just a few brief words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, all of you, for being here and for those that are getting awards I know how much work goes into this, how much effort, and generally new ideas and things that are done different from the past are uh, hard to get across. Not because the ideas generally are, the concepts are bad, it's the work and the politics and the institutions that you have to go through to get good things uh, accepted. Uh, I want to thank Carol Wyatt for all the great work she's done with form-based coatings. This is, I've taken a number of efforts in, in the built environment through preservation and uh, design competitions and et cetera, but this has been one of my most successful investments in, 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 in the built environment. And I've been reading and hearing more about how successful it's been and how it's been more readily adopted. And I couldn't be more proud of like the work you're doing and you're doing really big picture work and it's going to make large impact uh, over time and this is so different I mean architecture was done hundreds of years ago when you look at talk of timeless cities in Europe I mean they were so extraordinary they grew organically they grew over time they had a coherence and a continuity to them and those cities today remain some of our most beautiful cities and, and what you're doing now for the small towns and main streets and even other cities, we're helping to restore the original uh, intent and make them uh, attractive again and make them more economically viable. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and I want to continue to give my support to these efforts and, and try to make it, uh, maybe make it even more uh, maybe more easier to do. I had a lunch today and we we're talking about that our built environment has been too much financially oriented and too much one-dimensional and too, too much trading, if you will, in buildings. And buildings essentially shouldn't, historically, they weren't traded. They were built for a family or community or a neighbor, they, and they stayed in the family. This was hundreds of years ago. Today, so much of the commercial buildings are built and then they're sold after about five or seven years and then somebody else gets them. And, they don't know what they're, what they're just looking at them as an economic uh, alternative asset class. And the buildings are, are much more than that. So what I so appreciate about what you're doing, you're creating a coherency, a consistency, and an order to a city to make it more, or a place to make it more livable, make it more economically viable, and to make people really have a sense of who they are, why they're there, and really a sense of, of place. Uh, and that's so important today. And to maintain their, their historical feel or stature or elements is, is so terrific. Because we've gone so international now, everything's the international style, you don't know where you are. It's important to know, I think, where you are and why you're there and, and really what it's, what it's about. It gives us a self of, gives a better self of us and it gives us a better sense of something to really be um, proud of. 
So congratulations to all of you and congratulations to the winners. Thank you. Thank you again, Richard. I have just a housekeeping announcement that um, those of you that are wishing AIA or AICP credits, this session will count for three, three hours or three credits. And uh, AIA people, if, don't forget to sign up uh, at some point before you leave. Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce the chairman of today of the jury for the 2012 Driehaus Form Based Codes Awards. Anna Hellebert Sanchez, AICP, is a Loeb Fellow or has just completed a Loeb Fellowship at, the Har at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She was planning director, as many of you know, for the city of Miami from 1999, 1998 excuse me, to 2010 and led the, the Miami rezoning initiative to make Miami, Miami a more sustainable, pedestrian-friendly, and better planned city with a form-based code. So I can't thank her enough for doing a beautiful job of chairing the jury today, or, or through, uh, leading up to today, and I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce the rest of the jury. Thank you all for being here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I think it's exciting for me to be here because uh, I think our first award for Miami 21 was this award, um, which we were extremely proud and made copies and gave it to every single commissioner available. So I am thankful and excited to, uh, to be part now on the other side. I would like to introduce the uh, other members of the jury. Eduardo Castillo, architect and principal of Castillo Architects from Guatemala City. Uh, Robert Sikowski, uh, an attorney, a uh, real estate officer at the University of Connecticut, and Dr. Emily Tallinn, who's sitting right here, uh, mm -hmm. professor at the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State. This year, we have two awards. We have two awards, and we have uh, an honorable mention. Uh, today, I have the honor of present you the two winners of the Dry House Form Based Award. And if I could, I know we're going to have a presentation, but if I mentioned that if the representative of the firms could stand up for recognition, I would appreciate it. Um, the first one would be the Transit Zoning Code for the City of Santa Ana by the firm of Mole and Polisoides. <laughs> and uh, also a winner, the City of Bradenton Form-Based Code, Land Use and Development Regulations by the firm of Dover Coal Partners. <laughs> and there was, uh, the jury also gave an honorable mention to El Vedado Municipal Code uh, in Havana, Cuba. Um, this was, uh, the jury appreciated this international submission um, it was a code, and I'll just mention a few things because I know from the other two you will hear a presentation, but this code preserves the character and the architectural heritage of El Vedado in, uh, in Havana. Um, and to us it was a great satisfaction to see how the language of form-based code is actually going beyond the U.S. and into other countries. And I know there's many here um, sitting with me at the jury that have done it in their own countries, but it's exciting to see how we're reaching out. Um, I also have been told, and I'm not sure if Sonia Chow is here in the audience, um, but I have been told that as a result of this code, the uh, National Planning Institute in Havana has instituted the form-based code model for the whole country. Um, so I would hope either Sonia Chow or Javier Iglesias from DPC would be here to, uh, on behalf of the submission presented, but it was worth mentioning. Um, that close to us, something else has been done. What, what, this is a, what, I'll try to very quickly go through what is going to happen since it's a long session. We're going to have first a presentation uh, from the uh, 
Transit Zoning Code of City Santa Ana. The moderator will be Eduardo Castillo. We're going to have a presentation, an overview of the code, and then we're going to have questions. So the audience, you will have an opportunity to ask the questions as it pertains to the particular code that is being presented. Afterwards, we'll hear from the city of Bradenton, and the moderator would be Bob Sikowski, um, which again will be, again, the overview, the presentation, and we will have an opportunity for questions. And finally, um, we will have a discussion with Elizabeth platter Seiberg and Stefano Polisoides and Dr. Emily Tallinn will be moderating that discussion. Um, we're looking forward to an engaging session. And with this, I would like to introduce Eduardo, thank you. Thank you, Ana. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be introducing the, um, the Form Based Code Award to Santa Ana Renaissance Transit Zoning Code. Um, the jury was impressed um, with, the, with several things in this code. Uh, beginning with uh, how clear and organized the information is presented. Um, this is a transect-based code, although it, it doesn't use the transect uh, system or, or, or it doesn't, doesn't use the word transect, but it's based on the same principle, but it has, it, it's calibrated in a very subtle way uh, and we, we appreciated that because I, I, it, sh it shows that they, they were paying a lot of attention to each street and how each one varies from the other. Um, there's a rich variety of building types and elements also. Uh, we, we, and that, that, that show great examples of how to build a city, especially when it comes to the architectural guidelines and the, the architectural code. And it, 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 it gives you um, a set of building types that any developer can look at and say, okay, this is something that we haven't been thinking about for the last 50 years, and maybe we can implement these building types as part of the urban fabric. Um, and, and probably the most impressive is the outstanding quality of the graphics and the visual presentation of this code. It was just, uh, we really enjoyed looking at it and, and, and examining it. Um, Um, the regulating plan describes six different uh, zones um, for, the, for, the, for the city of Santa Ana. And they, they, they vary, um, so, sometimes very subtly. Um, and here you have a table um, where they describe each of the, of the zones in detail and what type of buildings are allowed in each one, the frontages, the heights, height restrictions, and, and setbacks, uses. And the, the way it's, it is organized, it goes from the, 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 the various um, general parts of the, of, the, of the neighborhood into the very specific um, elements of buildings and, ar and the architecture. And these are the tables they created for, for the, the individual uh, zones. Um, and then it goes into the architectural standards and building types. And they created this wonderful graphic that, that show you the, the different building types that are supposed to belong to each of the transect zones. And the way it is presented is graphically beautiful and very easy to understand and follow. Then after that, after introducing the building types, it goes into more detail into each of the specific building types and shows, shows you different ways to approach it and how the, the different building types can fit on a lot. And you not only... Uh, and we, we were interested that they explored this idea of the middle of the transect a lot and using courtyard uh, building types that can accommodate different uses, uh, residential and commercial, uh, and also uh, bungalow courts and other building types that are missing from the, the, develop, the, the current developer's uh, grammar, so to say. Um, they, they also went into 
into the into the frontages, and they did very specific, um, very very specific drawings and, and diagrams of different build in frontage types. Uh, the, in principle, is similar to the the smart code, but it goes into more more depth, I think, and it shows you the link between the the diagram and the pictures of how it can actually look. Um, so it's very easy to follow. Um, in this one, you have the galleries, and it also deals with architectural styles and selects diff uh, um, a palette, a set of architectural styles that are appropriate for the town, and also gives you directions as to what the most important elements are of each style and how they can be applied. Um, and it's also interesting to see, know that they they rely on traditional types that, uh, that belong in the region, like the, the mission style. Um, but they also explore more contemporary aesthetics and also try to come up with a code or a set of language and elements that explain how a contemporary uh, architectural language can be adapted uh, into the code. Um, Another interesting thing that we found is that the, the, the code not only dealt with the individual lots and buildings, but it also dealt with the subdivision of, of land inside the, inside the town, and, and it does so in a very clear way. Uh, although this is a, a place that's already uh, built, I mean, it has the streets, I mean, they're, they're, they're suggesting some connections, um, but it's not a greenfield, but they, it shows you in a very clear way different ways that you can approach uh, uh, an empty piece of land and how to subdivide it and where the alleys are supposed to go, where the frontages are supposed to go, um, how to subdivide a block into, into smaller increments as well. And lastly, it, it also deals with street network concepts, uh, although it doesn't prescribe uh, specific sizes of streets, uh, it does show you um, different concepts for streets that are existing. Um, this, this is one of the, the questions that we had as a jury probably, that, is that why, they, why they didn't implement streets that were already defined. But I'm sure and that's something that's going to come up in the conversation later on. So without further ado, uh, we would like to present the, the award to the team. Thank you, Carol. And let me read it. It says, um, to the City of Santa Ana Transit Zoning Code. The City of Santa Ana Transit Zoning Code is a national model for the way it focuses on the subtleties of building placement, massing, building and frontage types for an existing 457-acre community. The code illustrates main examples for best practices for the missing middle of the transect, providing a set of tools for the community as it evolves. The visual presentation of the code, especially the architectural standards and building types, is an impressive model worthy of emulation. The code document is well organized, clear, and easy to use. This award is presented to the following team members who participated in the development of the code. The City of Santa Ana, Molan Polisoides, Architects and Urbanists, Crawford, Multari, and Clark Associates, uh, Port, Paul Crawford uh, posthumously, MR plus E, Historic Resources Group, Gibbs Planning Group, t and Engineering, and Fong Hart Schneider. Um, so it's um, my honor to present this award to Karen Jalusa from the city of Santa Ana, Stefanos Polisoides, Molan Polisoides, and Tony Perez of Tony Perez and Associates. Karen Halusa from the city of Santa Ana is now going to to, to present. Um, do you have your notes? Yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, it, it got the screen. Great. Thank you, Eduardo. Think of all of the things that, in your mind, make a great urban place. Walkable streets, connected spaces, great buildings, vibrant, people-filled places. Well, the city of Santa Ana had all of that. It was walkable and compact. The buildings had beautiful architectural design and frontages that embraced the street. There was a mix of compatible uses. Huge swaths of land weren't given over to parking lots. And it was the type of place that we all use as an example of how cities should look and should function. But over a period of about 30 years, downtown Santa Ana was systematically dismantled. Through a series of changes to development standards and urban renewal type of projects that fundamentally changed the face of downtown Santa Ana. For us, the Transit Zoning Code was a tool for healing and repairing this urban fabric. It was also the beginning of a discussion within our own city organization that began to establish relationships and collaboration among disparate departments that had competing goals so that we could acknowledge the interconnectedness of land use, traffic engineering, economic development, and community design. And it's already revolutionized the way we do work at City Hall. This is an aerial photograph of downtown Santa Ana in 1947, though what it's depicting is largely what was constructed at the turn of the century. You can see that it's characterized by a finely gridded st street network, cohesive neighborhoods that had mixed density housing, and buildings with friendly front porches and courtyard housing. Cars took access from the alley, and there was a clear commercial core that also housed the civic uses such as the old city hall and in the, that yellow box, the old Orange County Courthouse. Now, keep your eyes on that yellow box. Huh. This is downtown cool. Santa Ana today. The interconnected gridded street system, well, it's been replaced by swooping one-way arterials that are very efficient at getting people into and out of the downtown as quickly as possible. The civic uses that created employment and drew people to the commercial core, well, they were sucked out and segregated behind fortress-like walls and even moats in a new civic center compound. The area that you see that's sort of circling circled by those swooping arterials is actually sunken down below street level and there are walls that go around it. It's almost impossible for the thousands of employees in that area to now walk to what is an incredibly walkable and, and very beautiful downtown still. There are beautiful historic blocks. We have two National Register districts in downtown Santa Ana. Well, what happened to those? Now, when I show you the next picture, don't worry, this wasn't demolished, but this is an example. Most of them were demolished, and they were supplanted by buildings like this one that rejected the street and created an environment that was openly hostile to the people who lived there. And the city's codes allowed these buildings to be constructed without any sense of context or compatibility with existing neighborhoods. And this project was constructed in one of our National Register districts. As you can imagine, this sort of development was so hated that the city actually stopped all residential development for the next 20 years. The Transit Zoning Code has begun to reverse that way of thinking. Through its adoption, we were able to demonstrate to our public and to our elected officials that the city now had tools in place to ensure that the development that had gone so wrong in the past couldn't occur again. We were even able to raise awareness and build support for the stopping of closing off streets. We had several situations where streets were closed and actually parking structures were built right over the, the streets themselves. And we were able once again to begin building the sort of housing that was so badly needed in our community. The city of Santa Ana is one of the most densely populated cities in the country. And again, for 20 years, we built no new housing while our population continued to skyrocket. 
Since its adoption, there are now over 200 units of new courtyard-style affordable housing under construction in one of the worst housing markets in California's history. The skeptics told us that the code would price out all development, let alone affordable housing, because the code's design standards would be too expensive to implement, but they were wrong. The adoption of the code has also enabled the city to win several multi-million dollar grants to fund the design and construction of a new streetcar system, which, ironically, we had before. The reason we were so successful with these grants, both state and federal grants, was because we could show, through the adoption of the code, that we had made a commitment to linking land use and design with transportation planning. In fact, the city's push for transit was the tool that ultimately enabled us to get support for the code's adoption, hence its name, the Transit Zoning Code. Now, has this plan been controversial? It absolutely has, and it actually continues to be. The adoption process took over three years, but I have to tell you, it was entirely worth it. People both inside and outside City Hall have begun to understand that great communities don't just happen. There has to be a plan. And I, I think through this plan now, we're beginning to see that the urban fabric of Santa Ana is beginning to heal. And now we have a tool that can enable us to continue that progress out into the future. And we're very pleased to receive this recognition today. And also, I would just like to again recognize um, posthumously Paul Crawford for his work on the plan as well. So thank you. Hi, I'm Tony Perez, and uh, uh, thanks to Karen and her team for sticking it, um, sticking through it, and sticking uh, through all the, the three years of adoption trials. It's pretty, pretty incredible process. And as you'll see in the question and answer period, what, some of the questions we've already heard about, you know, if you're wondering why certain things are turned down or are off or missing, that's part of the process that, that they went through. Um, I was asked to quickly identify five pieces to an approach uh, or to this approach for making a code like this and making this one in particular. Um, can I switch the picture on the screen to something else? I'm not using any slides, so I'll just go like that. Uh, okay. Because the other one's so horrible to look at. Uh, it's like looking at a car accident, you know, for forever. Um, yes, certainly. Is that better? Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I've been asked to talk about these five pieces to the approach of making a code like this. And um, the, I'm going to give them to you in an overview so um, you know where I'm going. And then I'll go back through them. The first one is it's, this kind of a code is based uh, on a physical vision based on existing typological conditions and the nature of intended change. The second one is the public realm is articulated as, as an armature to shape and be shaped, shaped by individual blocks and buildings. Each place within this whole environment is analyzed typologically in terms of its urbanist ingredients, and it's organized into zones by development intensity. So on that continuum, while we're not saying transit explicitly, it's implicit in all of this work and, and the understanding. The fourth one is typological ingredients that serve each zone um, do that. They, they're built to, they're calibrated for that zone, its purposes, and, and the long-term character of that zone. And then the last one, succe successional urbanism. How do we add new types, new zones, et cetera? So the first one, um, physical vision based on existing typological ingredients and the nature of intended change. By aligning the, our analytical work with the structure of the code that it would ultimately be put into and inform and make and, and execute the vision, by aligning those two things, we gained a strong and comprehensive typological understanding about the policy direction that was necessary for the existing condition, the policy direction for what would be conserved, changed, or regenerated, and then the phys physical attributes of the vision itself. So a lot of times you'll get a vision or it's people will generate a vision, but you don't know what it means until you start taking it apart. Well, we began you know, early on in the an analysis of what does this place consist of typologically? What are the ingredients at the end that we'll need to know about in, in, in the beginning to make this place you know, some kind of system that we can understand and operate on? Second one is the public realm is articulated as an armature to shape and be shaped by individual blocks and buildings, and that's huge. It's not the landscape, it's not the streetscape, it's the 
be the front and the sides of all those blocks and all those lots. So understanding the street network and its variety of streetscapes, um, it's calibrated in response to the intended change on a block-by-block -block basis. And that's why if you, if you um, we didn't do this by zone for the public realm. The, the zones were informed by and informed the public realm. It was back and forth. I, I don't know which one was done ultimately at the end or last, but it's a back and forth, uh, seriously. Um, and by the way, in this code, in this type of code, the public, re public realm or the street network is handled as a separate part of the code as opposed to having those standards in a zone, like say if you're doing something from scratch, because it's all there, it exists, and it's, it's the nature of change that you're trying to respond to. The third one, each place is analyzed typologically in terms of its urbanist ingredients and organized into zones by development intensity. Um, areas of distinct physical character were identified and then articulated to reflect both the existing ingredients and what was necessary in the end. And then each resulting zone is named uh, accordingly. So for example, in this code, we have everything in the continuum between T3 and T6. So we have urban neighborhood one on the lowest end of the spectrum, and then transit village, which is 25-story towers at the T6 level. Um, so even though we didn't use those terms, it's implicit in, in this work. Um, and then each zone is equipped with the, with the ingredients that you all saw in that code uh, that were explained by Eduardo. Uh, and then fourthly, the typological ingredients serve the zones and are calibrated to deliver their long-term character. So instead of the, um, as you see sometimes, the, the types uh, drive the zones. Here, because of what was revealed through analysis and by policy direction, what kind of changes people wanted, we could hone in on what types needed to be there and how those types needed to be adjusted to do the work to support those places. One example of this is the flex building, which you all might call a shop front building. Flex building in, um, in downtown Santa Ana is allowed up to 10 stories, although the upper five stories would have to be moved back like halfway into the block to conserve that five-story streetscape, which is historic. So from the perspective of the pedestrian, that streetscape stays pretty much the same. From, from an intensity level, it changes without really hurting that uh, from, the, from the street. But that same type is changed in another zone, an urban center, only to five stories. It's because of the adjacencies that urban center zone has that are different from the, the uh, downtown zone. So that same type operates very differently across the zones, which are a continuum of, in and of themselves, as, as a building type as well. And then fifth, uh, successional urbanism, adding new types, adding new zones, time release zones, changing the rules over time. Um, we have since learned a lot about adding new types. This code has a couple provisions, most explicitly in the street type uh, chapter, and it's implicit for the rest of the code. But how to add new types that we didn't think about that, that might be revealed or might be uh, invented in the next 10, 15, 20 years, having processes for that. How to adjust the types. Because of the information we gained early on, we had so much information about each of those types across the spectrum of this whole place Somebody could go in a couple years from now, 10 years from now, and start adjusting, say, the frontage types for this block or that street or th those sets of blocks to respond to something that you know, is, is going to change, um, and then adding new zones in the same way. And since then, we've developed um, more explicit procedures about and, and, and information requirements about what it means to add a new type, not just to propose and it gets added. Well, how does that fit in with the vision? How does it fit in with the vision you're proposing to adjust? Maybe you have a new vision that's, that's great. How does that, that fit in with all of, of the, the policy direction that the people set up at the city, the community? And then last, time release zones. There's a great example here of um, the, uh, the way I like to explain it is that the, the owners of certain industrial properties that, that over the long term they saw their properties on a bigger map uh, not really playing into this transit village, their industrial shops that could be anywhere. Um, but they had viable businesses, and in the next five to ten years, they just said, we can't, we can't see going out, we're going to fight the code. And so the, the ultimate solution, the city came up with this. They said, let's just put the, the new zones. Let's not change the intent of the plan. Let's put the new zones on pulleys, hold it up in the air, let the current zoning stay there. And when the, when the owners choose to change, and they know they, that it will, they can cut the ropes on that, the zoning hits the ground, and they conform to this new plan. So the, the intent of the plan wasn't changed. It was all there, and people are very clear on what's going to happen. Because the alternative would be, well, let's just, let's just take it away and deal with it later, right? And then you sort of make that the, the ultimate, the, the, the future, very fuzzy. But thankfully, that didn't happen. 
And then lastly, I want to add this one. Um, the sixth one is sneaking on you. Uh, over and over, uh, learn this uh, the hard way. Test, adjust, and retest, and then finalize. And we did that to a good extent in Santa Ana, but since then have done it to a uh, much greater extent that testing along the way, not only the content of the code, but how it's working, how people are reading it, how it fits them, how it doesn't fit them. It's so local. And even though you know, the systems have their strengths, uh, I would say it, um, you have to test with the staff, the community, the development community, and the decision makers, um, and ultimately you know, get over the adjustments, fix it, and fix it for them. Thank you. At this moment, Ellen, um, Tony and Karen are here, and they can take your questions or, or the jury's questions also if Bob or Anna wants to add something to, to this, or if anyone has a question in the audience. The question was, how do we actually implement the conversion of what we call an industrial overlay zone onto the properties that are currently being used as industrial land? The properties in that area actually have essentially two zones. And so the zone that we ultimately want to have implemented, which in this case is called Urban Neighborhood 2, is on the property today. If the owner wants to develop to those standards, then they go through an administrative process. They don't have to go through a zone change or anything like that. And they legally convert it to the urban neighborhood zone. If they want to continue operating as industrial, they can continue doing that. And in all cases here, these are very old industrial uses adjacent to a railroad that had been a freight railroad primarily, which is now almost exclusively a commuter railroad. And so that's why we're moving forward with wanting to transition this area into mixed use and residential development. So it's written into the code. And the standards are the same standards for this area as they would be for the other urban neighborhood areas. That was a huge concern of ours and also one way that we were able to eliminate the opposition from these owners because, of course, if you zone them into nonconformity, it's a huge impact on the value of their property. And so they can continue operating just as they are today to the extent they're not currently conforming to the industrial code. They're still in noncompliance there. And if they were to do expansions or anything, they have to come up to the standards of that code. However, there isn't any penalty for them if they continue in that way. So for us, it was a huge, huge win when we said, hey, you can keep operating as you are, plus we're going to give you this option that actually increased the value of their land because these are very, very underutilized industrial properties. These are, in most cases, buildings that have outlived their economic life decades ago. 
So it really was a win for them. They just wanted to continue operating the way they were. Um, uh, I, I have a follow-on question, if, if you don't mind, before we go back out to the audience. It's on this, this issue. Um, those of you who know, who, who know um, my practice is um, I have a, a big concern about uh, properties being zoned in two categories. And I understand the, um, the comfort that it gives the landowner to kind of trigger uh, this, this new zone. But have you found, uh, I've got two questions. So first, of all, first of all, how, uh, what percentage of the, is, it, is roughly 480 acre area, what percentage of that area is eligible for this, uh, this two zone approach? It's probably maybe what, 20%? Okay. 10. 10%. So it's a, it's, a, it's a vast minority. It's a vast right? minority. So it's a special case kind of thing. Yes. Um, and did you find any, um, uh, any legal questions on having two, uh, it, this is the, the, the problem of a parallel code, obviously, right? People have a parallel code, it's zoned to uh, two different categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, did, you, did, did anybody examine the, the, the legal ramifications under California law mm -hmm. for that? We have many examples in California of what we call overlay zones. So this isn't an unusual zoning tool at all. And in fact, we already had an existing one within Santa Ana. And I would, I'm a zoning purist too. I hate having overlay zones. I would have rather just torn off the Band-Aid and said, look, you're urban neighborhood now. But that wasn't politically feasible, and we would have had to have jettisoned the entire plan. And an overlay zoning tool is a very good tool. And I don't think, in my experience, when you zone things into nonconformity, they don't usually change. They just create a situation where now you have a lot of nonconforming properties. And it really depresses the economic value of those properties. So we thought that it was a very good tool to use. We had no legal problems with it at all. Uh, but can I make, a, not to put too fine a point on it, as I understand overlay zoning, overlay zoning te technically is in addition to the base zone. So you have a base zone X, right. and then you have additional requirements. For example, in a historic district, you put a whole other layer of additional requirements. Mm -hmm. As I understand your approach, it's different. It's it an either or. So it's in my understanding, it's not the same as a typical overlay zone. It's, it's either or until such time that you choose to exercise the conversion, at which point the underlying zoning, the previously zoned property, goes away. Okay. So it supplants it. And, and it, it, it it's, it's, in effect, a rezone upon yes. the landing. Right. Yes. So it's really kind of, a, for the lawyers among us, it's really kind of a combination between a floating zone and an overlay zone at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's very unique. Thanks. That's why I call it a time release. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Uh, I'm here in this circuit, so I'm going to be putting a on the face. It's understand that this is a form based code that doesn't deal with the public realm. You're not dealing with the street space. No. So I'm going to say this one side of the back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The question is, how do you do a code like this and not deal with the public realm? Um, yeah, I, I might have mentioned it too quickly in my, my brief comments, but uh, no, we dealt very much with the public realm. If you could see the, the portion of this code that, that wasn't adopted in full, um, dealing with all the streetscapes block by block, uh, you would see that. And I'm, I'll let the city give you the answers of why specifically it didn't happen. But um, the... Um, the public realm was within all of the street sections, which you saw in this code have been turned into street concepts, which for a bunch of technical and political reasons within the city, they had to deal with that in another effort, which is underway right now. So all that information is informing the, 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 uh, the restoration of all the streetscapes throughout the whole plan area. Um, but we, we just couldn't get it adopted in this version of the code, and I'll let Karen tell you why. You can see from the photo where we were in our mindset in dealing with public realm. So this code was a huge shift forward in our organization of getting people to think differently about the relationship between land use and public realm. We had no concept of that at all. 
planning stopped at the private property line, Public Works took over from there. There was no conversation between those two things. So this was part of that incremental evolution in moving, the, moving us forward toward a much, much better place. And we're working right now on our circulation element update, and it will be able to take advantage of all of the work that we did in what was originally a specific plan that was on, that only the zoning component of it, the regulating plan was the only part that ultimately got adopted, but that work wasn't lost. And as I said in my comments, it helped to educate our staff and our decision makers about what this whole concept is. And so now all of that work is getting translated into our circulation element, which will then be actually more powerful than this code because it will then form the basis for our public works standards. And that's really where that change needs to be made in order to have lasting change in your public realm. By the way, just to follow up on that, I wanted to explain this thing about knowing a lot about the types you have in your, in your city or your plan area. If you look at this code, the street sections that are in there, which are just called streets concepts, if you look below, you can see where all the numbers used to be and they've just been cut off. In the sections themselves, we've highlighted the portions of each section w w which were to change. So based on the nature of intended change, conserve um, or regenerate at both ends of the spectrum. Each of the sections, like everything else in the code, is expected to change. And it's most evident in those street sections. You could see it, what parts of the. So it's a great direction for the people redoing all the standards. It's not just numbers. It's actually contextual. Can I ask uh, one follow-up uh, on this, this point? Is it, when you talk about your circulation element, is this a, a feature specific to California planning that, that you can um, start to regulate in other ways other than through a zoning code? Yes, in California, all cities are required to have a general plan. Some areas of the country, it's called a comprehensive plan. And we have mandated elements or sections or chapters. One of those elements is the circulation element. And it deals with everything having to do with mobility throughout the city. But it's typically only focused on streets. And it has to be, in another terrible twist for California cities, it has to be compliant in our case with the County of Orange's master plan of arterial highways, if we want to get public funding for street improvements, our streets have to be designed to their standards and they aren't anything that any of us would like. So we are actually through the circulation element process now working to get, working to get our own county to change their policies about what good street design should be. So we are really, really restricted not just by our own city's rules but also by our county's rules and how that allows us to be competitive for funding. So it's a huge, huge problem in having our street sections redesigned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, Karen, I have one question. Could you expand on open space and how you dealt with it? Sparks and open space? Mm -hmm. Pro probably similar to the streets. Yeah, okay. same, same yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, parks and open space were a component of the specific plan, and, and had that been adopted, there would have been an implementation section about that. And diagrams that were in the original plan did identify locations for open space. And I wish I could say that that part of the plan got adopted, but it did not. And we are currently trying to understand how we can work through that. We're a very park-poor city. But we are trying to leverage relationships with existing schools. We have many elementary schools in the area. So we're creating um, joint partnership agreements with them so that the open space on the schools, which had previously been closed outside of school hours, can be opened. And sort of trying to leverage existing resources because we're a built out environment. Had we wanted to implement any type of new open space, it would have required acquisition of existing homes, basically, and then constructing new parks, which, as we all know, is a very difficult process. So what we've really tried to do is to focus on having the parts of the code that make interiors, especially of multifamily housing, be almost their own open space in a way, which in the pictures that I showed you, those sorts of projects had none of that. So you're using the courtyard type to create semi-public space or inside, the, inside the buildings, basically. For those that for, are for of that type, yeah. Right. Well, then also, 
Also, this code is saying uh, it's, it's um, veering away from what the city had been doing in terms of looking at housing as, as just volume, FAR, and density. So people would say that these are, you know, the whole deal. These, this is how many units I get on my property, you know, get out of my way. Uh, now, a duplex through a quadplex is a, is a building type, and it has its requirements for open space on the lot. You know, it's no mystery to us, but it is to a lot of people that don't work that way. So open space is present on the lot at every scale from house um, up through courtyard and, and, you know, up into the, except when you start displacing the whole lot with a building, like, say, tower. Even towers have open space requirements as well. So, yeah, in addition, to, or in lieu of ascribing it out on the blocks of where the city was going to acquire land, we dealt with it um, uh, on each lot with each building. Okay. Are, are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Mode. The transit mode that we're currently working towards achieving is a streetcar system, a fixed guideway system. We already have commuter rail that serves the downtown. We have a train station right in our downtown area. And so we were able to use this plan. It was a big part of our application process for the state and federal funds that we were able to get in order to fund a new streetcar system. Right. Well, thank you very much, Karen and Tony, and thank you, Eduardo. At this time, I would like to introduce you Bob Sitkowski. Um, he will give you an overview of the Bradenton Code. Okay, thank you, Anna. And, and thank you, everybody from Santa Ana. Uh, congratulations, and uh, thank you for taking the time to answer those in-depth questions. Um, you will see uh, probably some similarities here and some differences, because what, we, what we've got here, um, much like Santa Ana, and what the jury was uh, grappling with was uh, we are starting to see uh, applications over uh, what, what we would call infill, applications over existing areas, existing building patterns, multiple property ownership, and certain issues are starting to bubble out of that, much like what Tony described uh, of this uh, time release zoning kind of concept. Uh, it really goes to mapping, uh, you know, how, how you create streets where there are none over multiple property ownership and how you broker those and how you try to prevent the code from tanking. The, the, the same kinds of things are happening and we are presented with a, another way to, to look at this. And Bradenton is our example. Um, and how I'm going to do this is I'm going to give the jury observations, unlike Eduardo, where I'm not going to walk you through the code. I'm going to give you the jury observations, then we're going to present the award, and then uh, Tim Polk, who is the uh, Planning and Community Development Director from Bradenton, is going to walk you through the code, and, and then we'll go to questions, much, much the same. So um, those of you who, uh, who, who know when, I, when we teach the uh, Form Based Codes 301 class, there's a whole section on uh, adopting codes and, and how to prepare for that. And it could be any kind of code, but we focus on form-based codes. Um, and the, the shorthand I always like to use is complete, neat, and organized. Um, you saw it in Santa Ana, and we saw it in Bradenton. Um, it is comprehensive, it's easy to follow, it's beautiful graphically, uh, it's, it's complete, it's neat, and it's organized. Um, what I, uh, and by the way, the, thing of the, the other difference here between Bradenton and Santa Ana is Bradenton is based on a smart code platform, highly, highly calibrated, and, and you can see that the, uh, the, in the calibration, again, those of you who know my preferences, I like to see the administrative provisions highly calibrated because to me, what counts is when people come in for applications and build buildings under these because that's what you want to promote, and this code, uh, has an amazingly good administrative calibration, very specific to Florida law, very specific to this city, uh, very detailed. I'd be very interested to hear uh, 
knowing the economy, how applications are going under this coda was extremely easy to read and very, very impressive. Um, what the shorthand here on ambitious coverage of topics is it's got the smart code platform and it has many of what have, uh, have uh, come to be known as smart code modules. They weren't strictly modules because some of them were developed out of whole cloth, but the ambitious coverage, and you'll, you'll see it uh, when uh, Tim gets up here, but it ranges from pu a public art element, uh, light imprint, storm uh, water handling, uh, affordable housing, uh, sustainability, all of the things you want to see, again, it goes to this completeness and this comprehensiveness. Very, very impressive, easy to follow. Um, but it also, the other part uh, of this is the landing of the regulating plan. And it's another one of my favorite uh, topics, which is how do you actually map this thing on an existing area with existing people and large scale properties that you might want to cut up and who takes responsibility for streets? Um, not sure uh, how that's actually being done on the ground, but it really looks like the, the, um, the regulating plan, which Tim will describe, uh, is very detailed, very sensitive to many existing conditions and, and tries to promote the best types of urbanism but while keeping the types of urbanism that exist in this 1,800 acre, by the way, 1,800 acre infill area. Um, Santa Ana was big close to 500 acres, that's pretty hard to handle, 1,800 acres here. Um, the other thing that was handled very well here, uh, and very realistically, we thought, was in the architectural standards. We heard a, we heard a very good approach here. Uh, an approach that was taken in um, Bradenton was uh, more of, a, uh, more of an, an explanation of the handling of architectural elements, some of which were mandatory, and some of which, through the political process, started to become advisory. Um, when then, then the code started to look at when you have a lot of advisory things, for instance, there are significant style elements, there are some significant architectural elements that are suggested and they're persuasive. They are supported in this code by exemplary photographs and illustrations. Very, very well supported, but, the, but what counts here are the words the words are explicit that the stylistic references are for uh, context only. They are not requirements. So it was a, a wonderful way of uh, getting the architecture out there while not hampering the code and getting people focused on, uh, as uh, Jeff Farrell has described them, the dress code for buildings issue as opposed to the urbanism issue. So we thought that was handled extremely well. Uh, with that said, with my short operation, I'd like to um, bring Tim up, I'd like to introduce Tim Polk, the Planning and Development Director for the City of Bradenton to accept his, uh, the uh, 2012 form -based, uh, Dray House Form-Based Code Award. Uh, Tim, Tim, the, uh, uh, the Form-Based Codes uh, Institute awards the City of Bradenton Form-Based Code Land Use and Development Regulations. The City of Bradenton Form-Based Code Land Use and Development Regulations is a national model for the way it focuses on infill in an existing 1,830-acre community. This is a comprehensive smart code that has been incorporated and calibrated with new modules. Included are modules for sustainability, such as urban farming, wind power, solar power, and composting, public art, stormwater management, and lighting. Affordable housing is addressed within the code as well. Even with the addition of these multiple components, the code succeeds in being easily comprehended and implementable. The award is presented to the following team members who participated in the development of the code. The City of Bradenton, Dover Colon Partners, Hall Planning and Engineering, Inc., and Karen Murphy Planning and Consulting. Congratulations, Tim. Wow. 
I told my wife I was good, but I know I was that good. <laughs> my wife's standing. My wife's out there in the audience. Bridget, can you stand up? <laughs> well, Foreign Base Code was introduced to the city of Barrington in 2005 and 2006 as adjusted policy directive in the joint compatibility study with Manatee County in an evaluation appraisal report. Planners like to call it our EAR. The EAR was for the amendment of our state mandated comprehensive plan. Our consultants, our state mandated uh, plan consultants indicated that, that one of the recommendations from the county is to have the desire to have compatible development and redevelopment patterns throughout the county. In our jurisdictional boundaries and also uh, in throughout the county. However, the city of Brington is the only jurisdiction in Manatee County that felt that it was needed to, needed to happen. In June 8, 2011, Bradenton City Council adopted an ordinance 2930, the City of Bradenton Foreign Base Code Land Use Development Regulations. This, this was not the first time the Foreign Base Code was suggested to our city in at least two other times. It was suggested at least two other times when we amended our Bradenton TRA Master Plan by Downtown by Design and realized Brandon, a nonprofit created by our arts and cultural master plan, it again suggested as a policy directive, these are the timelines, events that led to the adoption of the foreign based code in the city of Brandon. In 2005 and 2006, in our year report, foreign based code was, in, was also in, indicated as, as a potential policy directive. In 2007, in downtown by design, in its adoption, it also was indicated as another policy directive. In 2008 and 2009, Various planning efforts were, were done as part of our comp plan. Our comp plan was changed of more of a, of, a, of a text document to actually a more of an illustrative document. It also had an element that dealt with design. In 2009, realized bringing our cultural and master arts plan also indicated a, a number of, of directives that we needed to look at. In 2010, on February, in February, uh, the zone districts were also consolidated. We, we consolidated our zoning district from 34 down to 14. And in that, we created, uh, 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 we, we created zoning districts such as Urban Core, uh, Urban Village, Urban Central uh, Business District. We also included uh, also Urban Commercial Corridor. I like to say, and sometimes my colleagues don't like me to say this, but we adopted form based code light before we adopted form based code. Okay. Also, then in September, the form based code process begins. On November, uh, the first draft was presented to our city council at a work session by our, by our, by our planning team, or Dover Cole and his team. 2011, revisions of February 2nd, the second draft was also presented to the uh, city council as a work session again. On March 16th, that's when the, the formal adoption procedures started in terms of public hearings. First going through the Planning Commission, uh, that, and finally was sent to April, April, to, April 13th to the City Council as a second reading. And then on June 8th, form based code was adopted by ordinance. Our regulating plan is a little bit different uh, that you see. We didn't adopt form based code for the whole city. We adopted primarily for our downtown and near downtown neighborhoods. The regulating plan was determined by the city council at a, at a work session in regards to looking at form based code. We initially wanted to only adopt uh, form based code primary for our downtown. But once we started talking about some of the debate issues in terms of having compatibility and wanted to make sure they had continuity in design, they felt that it needed to, to, we needed to include all our CRA, CRA areas, which are areas that we look at doing redevelopment to make sure that they're protected and make sure that we can get compatibly, compatible infill. And so what happened was uh, the, uh, the downtown and the near downtown neighborhoods were adopted as well as uh, the CRAs and, and also two neighborhoods that we wanted to protect, Point Pleasant and Old Manatee Village. And the regulating plan consisted of the following transects, T6, T5, T40, and T4R, T3, and SDI. You see the SDI is the area that, that currently what you see is sort of a, a grayish area where we have an industrial, uh, industrial um, uh, facility there. They opted not, they didn't want to be part of form-based code. I'm sorry. 
Okay. I got a new have a point. Okay. Uh, they decided they didn't want to be part of foreign based code, and so we gave them SDI designation. But I was telling Andrew uh, just about, about 10 minutes ago that they're warming up the foreign based code now, and that's Tropicana, Tropicana orange juice magnet. So they said, well, they said that, uh, we're, matter of fact, on Monday I'm going to be doing a, uh, a tour of their plant. And I'm the only one they're going to drop down on the plant by parachute, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> Next item is really the Article One provisions of, of approvals and land use rec requests. That is was a big issue when we when we talked to City Council in regards to our to our workshop. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they had still had a, a lot of touches in being able to do those things. So this chart was developed to be able to help us do that. And in, in really deciphering this chart, um, we looked at, we wanted to make sure that the consultant understood how important it, it was that in, in maintain procedural consistency, which was really one of the part of the things that we looked at in doing, our, in doing our RFQ and RFP. In writing of the code, we made it a point in the development of this chart that many of the existing regulatory framework, zoning and land use development regulation would not be compromised by the introduction of form-based code. This chart gives us a user a clear path when items can move forward administratively as well as legislatively for eventual approval with new codes and new, new rules for the City Council Board Commission and staff. I should say new roles and new rules for the City Council Board and Commission and staff. Speaking of new roles and new rules, uh, we had the bonuses of height. During the writing of the form base code, we thought it was important to follow the SMART code. Initially, we had a problem with the SMART code, uh, but we warmed up to it, and we followed the template uh, and that was led by our consulting staff. The template with the advent of incentives gives and gives and get rules, which we like to say, and would, would allow bonuses for height. If, if your development in, included provisions for LEED certification, 25% of the building dedicated as workforce housing units and meeting the exceeding requirement of 0.75% of the construction value of your project is dedicated to the inclusion of public art. We only included public art as requirement in, on, in, in only three transacts, T6, T5, and T40. Table 4.5 deals with building configurations. This table gives you a base heights with building configuration along the bonus heights and gives you the give and get rules are applied. Table 4.7, specific uh, functions and use. We wanted to uh, give a, a quick review of being able for a user to be able to do that, whether you're a staff or, or applicant applying uh, to do a project or do a deal. This table delegates uh, specific functions and uses with the transact zones. Using this table, we can determine if proposed development can be approved administratively or does it need to go through a legislative process. The rule of thumb is a field box indicates a by right designation with only staff uh, administrative review. And an empty box indicates that proposed project can only be approved by a special use provision. Legislative that would require two public hearings one before Planning Commission and the other before City Council. Table 5.1, building types compatibility. You, we use this word again, compatibility. In order to enhance range of character and achieve sustainability, architecture should be climate responsive, durable, and rooted in Brains' building traditions. The 16 building types on the next two slides work real well with architectural standards and seem to capture Brains' DNA and highlight six dominant architectural styles, Gulf Coast Mercantile, Florida Wood Vernacular, Mediterranean Revival, Craftsman, Contemporary, and Neoclassical. Article 5 deals with architectural standards in the Mediterranean Revival. These are some of the, the uh, photos, as uh, Bob was talking about, that's throughout the plan. And from time and time again, I've heard from uh, people who actually uh, got a chance to look at the, uh, uh, the foreign-based code document. 
they say that it's really understandable from the standpoint they can actually see when we talk about architectural standards, they can follow it, they get a good, they get a good idea of what we're looking for, and so that has been real helpful in being able to do that. Mediterranean Viable is one of the recommended architectural styles for a certain transect zone, and Section 5.5 gives the guidelines examples of properly composed and detailed buildings belonging to that style. But again, we have more that we, we also deal with. Table 6.4, vehicular lane and parking assembly. Now, this is one that gave our, our consulting team a little bit of heartburn. <laughs> I have to, be, have to be truthful. I'm going to be transparent. <laughs> the vehicular lane parking assemblies were thoroughly vetted by our city staff. Fire department, public works, planning, and community development to determine acceptable widths to, for travel lanes for no parking, one side parking, two side parking, angle parking, median park. And this also included turning radar. I know we all have been there, guys. I know that. The negotiations ended with a compromise that all dimensions and thoroughfare designs are subject to review by the Fire, Public Works Department, and the PCD director, me. Public planting. This table, sh this table shows street trees native to Florida and their corresponding shapes and appropriateness within the six transact zones. However, Article 7, landscape standards, turn out to be the most contested article in the writing of the code. Right, Andrew? <laughs> the consulting team and staff had to defend analysis that discovered that certain species listed to the chart are historically found growing in Florida counties to the north or, or to the south of Manatee County, but may reach maturity in the county in southwest Florida if planted and maintained correctly. The other contested items was inclusion of plant lists, believe it or not, plant lists, that caused considerable amount of discussion and debate. The city's uh, Tree and Land Preservation Board played a major role in getting everybody at the table and helping us broker an agreed list. And that was very important because at one time we were thinking about leaving the, the landscaping standards out and just moving forward. But I told my team we, we're going to have a complete code. Article 9. Light and print storm management. This approach promotes the use of various devices and filter uh, water and infiltrate the water into the ground, promotes the use of roofs and buildings, parking lots, and other horizontal services to convey water to either distribute into the ground or collect it for reuse. This article is applicable to all of our transacts. Public art. This was a dodgy one because uh, that was a mandate that came from our. our uh, downtown by design as well as our arts and cultural uh, master plan that wanted to inclusion of public art. Public art becomes applicable requirement to any property owner or developer who applies to the city for a building permit to construct or make improvements to a property within transects T40, T5, and T6. That exceeded $250,000 construction value and whose property falls within one of the following categories. Number one, Residential development is consisting of four or more units. Number two, all commercial or mixed use development. Three, all public facilities designed for use by the general public, constructed by the city or other government entities such as Manatee County, State of Florida, or federal government with, within the city's jurisdictions. Again, what we're finding, uh, even though public art is a requirement in those three transects, there has been no pushback. Uh, people see that it adds value to their project, and uh, now public art is a, is a common thing, and we love it. Appendix D, illustri il il illustrative rendering. This illustrative rendering highlights the urban format grocery store, and I saw in, the, in the, uh, one of the programs you have, you're talking about a grocery store. And so I feel your pain. I've been through this. <laughs> This is currently waiting for a letter of intent from a grocer, a grocer signature from a major grocer. Many of the, uh, of the new, urbanism, new urbanism design features attributed to the renderings have been captured by the developer and their design team in order to make this a development a multimodal and pedestrian-friendly uh, retail center and grocery store. 
And uh, so we're, 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 we're thinking this is going to be one that's going to be uh, something that will be promising because it's following all the mandates of, of our form based code. Um, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the key partners, uh, Dover Cole and his team. Will you please stand up? And we, we involve the community a lot. And uh, we stress that in our RFP and RFQ. And when we, before we signed the contract and talking with, with Dover Cole and partners, we stressed that we wanted to make sure that that happened. And they made it happen. And also a special thanks uh, goes out to all the individuals that volunteered their time for interviews, workshops, and sessions to make this award-winning code. Finally, lessons learned. I feel like David Letterman now. Number one, utilize the Form Based Code Institute's template in developing your RFP, RFQ request for proposals. Keep it short and to the point. And when we looked at this, we found out they had a template was like only six pages, and we did ours. Ours was less than, than 12. And matter of fact, a lot of the a lot of consultants, a lot of consultants, whoever bid on it or didn't bid on it, they, they enjoyed it that it wasn't it wasn't a book uh, in terms of doing that. Two, include a not to exceed contract amount in the RFP document. We had, a, we had a not to exceed amount, and it's funny that one of our consulting teams called us and said they wanted us, they wanted us to do a, a form based code for their city, but their city is, is three times larger than Bradenton, but they wanted to use your, your, uh, your contract amount. That's it. Good luck with that, man. <laughs> Three, utilize publications such as New Urban News and New Urbanism, Best Practices Guide, and doing your research for form-based code consulting firms. That is very important. Three, I mean, sorry, four, integration of form-based code into your city's existing regulatory framework, zoning and land development regulations in a manner that ensures procedural consistency. The next integration of stakeholders and technical review teams throughout the code writing process in order to explain the details of the new code and obtain further input and comments. And then finally, integrate city staff and stakeholders and technical review teams in order for buy-in and code writing ownership. That is very essential. We now have the fire marshal saying, well, I understand now we got form-based code. And actually, when we go through a development review committee with the fire marshal and the police department and the, uh, our building official and our, our development services manager are there, they're actually talking to the client or talking to the applicant and saying, uh, now, these are, these are reasons on the form-based code that gives you a buy-right way to get to where you want to go. And that's the fire marshal saying that, not the planning director, but the fire marshal saying that. Now, that's, that's important. Finally, in conclusion, the biggest lesson learned is form-based code doesn't diminish who we are. Form-based code gives dimensional form to who we want to be and, most importantly, how we want to look. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, what we're going to do, if, uh, if you'll bear with us here, before we go to qu your questions, uh, I've asked Andrew Georgiatis, uh, who worked on this code, to uh, give a little overview of the process and the, the public process by which they, uh, they developed uh, this form-based code. Because as I understand it, uh, they had some lessons learned and some experimentation on that end, too. So I'd like to turn it over to, to Andrew for a short time. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Georgiatis from Dover Coleman Partners. And Joe and Karen and Rick, you can also interrupt at any time if you want to chime in. So um, one of the challenges that we uh, faced when trying to design the public outreach process was how do we 
uh, adapt the charrette method that we normally use uh, in a, in, in a, for a project for which there would be no visioning because officially we, the vision had been established by the two previous documents that the city had already commissioned, which were Downtown by Design and Realize Bradenton, which already contained what, was, what we would have done, which was the illustrative master plan, had already been done. So what we wanted to do was to, uh, instead of uh, having the normal visioning exercises, was to turn the citizens into citizen coders when they came to the, to the charrette. So this required a, uh, quite a bit of preparation before the charrette, but it was, it was well, well worth it because it was a really fun exercise, which I think brought the whole community along in, in the coding. And um, so what we did is, of course, it's really difficult to take a, a, a whole group of, of citizens, several hundred citizens, out over a 2,000-acre uh, site, in, in, in even if you had more than a day. So what we did is we brought their city to them in, in the room by giving them uh, pieces of, of their city. Uh, that represented the best of their DNA. So we took their historic downtown, some of their best neighborhoods at scale and in photographs, and then had, had them measure uh, uh, those places and produce what the, the nerds, the planning nerds, call the synoptic surveys, but um, had them extract the DNA of their town. And then what we did is, is had them fill out these already prepared uh, uh, worksheets which addressed uh, issues such as setback and height and, and distance of uh, you know, tree to the curb, all, all the things that we know shape the public realm. And we had them fill those out and actually produce their first pages of code right there before, before the, Tim's very eyes. And then once they had those first rudimentary pages of code or DNA, then we gave them some of the eroded parts of town uh, uh, which the, where the urbanism had suffered over the, the decades, and then ask them to repair that based upon uh, the places they had measured. So once again, they got to repair what uh, uh, a commercial or mixed-use district, and others got to repair uh, a more uh, residential uh, type place, and then um, you, you know use what they had measured to do so. And it was really. It was really exhilarating and it was uh, educational for all of us and uh, we hope that if we get a similar assignment we'll be able to expand upon what we learned with Tim to, to make it uh, useful for other communities as well. So Tim was a great client and was uh, really allowed us to, to, to test some things out that we hadn't uh, been able to do exactly like that before. Thank you, Tim. Tim, do you have any follow-ons on that, or should we go to questions? I want, want, just want to make a little, little add-on what uh, Andrew was saying. When we talked about uh, community engagement in shaping the code, one of the persons at my table was a young lady who was working for the Southwest uh, Florida Museum. And she's now, she, she got so turned on in shaping the code, she is now studying to be a planner. <laughs> And, and she is a graduate student at the University of South Florida, and, she'll, and this summer she's going to be interning in my office. Um, okay, so uh, are there any questions? Oh, uh, Rick. Rick is raising his hand back here. He may have a comment. Thank you, Rick. Um, what, for the record, uh, because we didn't have a microphone on, on Rick, uh, uh, Rick described the process by which uh, the citizens got their first unveiling and their first crack at this uh, form-based code in a table session uh, where uh, typically in a planning and a vision session, you, you lay out, you get the citizen input through graphic representation and getting your hands on the sheets. And this is the first. Uh, to his knowledge, that it had been done for a zoning exercise, and that the, the people understood how to uh, organically uh, design their zoning yeah. through the process. Yeah. 
um, and that it's exempl another exemplary reason for this code. Um, can uh, we have some questions from the audience? Uh, Sam Poole. Uh, Sam asked, uh, at what point were the elected officials uh, engaged in the process? Uh, they, were, they were engaged early on. We had a number of work sessions. Uh, I did the work session initially in introducing form based co code to them. And that was, the same, that was the same day we actually set the regulating plan. Because we determined that we wanted to do more than downtown. We wanted to do all our CRA, community redevelopment uh, areas that are primarily set up for uh, infill and, and redevelopment. And also, they also wanted to, to protect two neighborhoods that were, that were currently under uh, some infill uh, um, activity that wasn't compatible, um, which was uh, Point Pleasant and, um, and also Old Manatee Village. And so that really set the standard. And then when we talked about joint, as part of the, the contract with Dover Cole and their team, they also made their first draft presentation in front of the city council uh, workshop as well as a second draft presentation before the city council workshop. And then right after that, that's when the public hearing process started, started going for the planning commission and eventually going for the city council for adoption with two reads because it's an ordinance. I think, I think one of the things I kept reminding my city council on is that form based code was a policy directive that came from them that was already voted on. So they already voted on form based code about three or four times <laughs> as they, by resolution. <laughs> and now the, the, now they voted on it by ordinance because it becomes law. So, and I, and I remind them that the policy directive was maybe initiated by staff, but it was voted on and approved legislatively by the city council. Yeah, Tim, Tim raises an interesting point. Uh, he and I were sharing a story on this point before the presentation. Um, I, in, in, in a more conventional context, I was working on a, a file where uh, we were trying to get a, a zone change. And um, the, elect, uh, the appointed officials, who were the actual body that, that were to make this decision, actually got squeamish about doing something progressive. And how they reacted was, oh, you know, I, I, I'm uncomfortable making this decision. We've got too much power in this board. This, this should be punted over to somebody else. And so I don't know if, uh, it, it didn't sound like they had, that they were squeamish about making this decision, but they had to be, they had to be prompted that they had already taken an action, right? <laughs> yeah. One of the things I told Bob is that when I, when I took this job about six years ago, I was shocked and amazed how much, how much power and how much deference they gave the planning department and the planning director. And say, they, they better thank God I'm not a poo-poo head because it would be disastrous. And so they had already, they already gave a lot of, like I said, a lot of power and a lot of deference even to our, even our land use regs and from the standpoint of how you go about vetting projects and how you go about doing, uh, doing uh, uh, regulating land use in the city of Bradenton, where the planning, the, the planning director and the planning department had a lot of difference in making sure things were done in a in a, a compatible way, in a way that that would promote uh, that would promote good design and all the other things that goes along with it, and so they've already had that already had that in place. Right, and that, yeah. that that's a that's a fine point here mm -hmm. because you know typically it, when you're trying to change a regulatory system, and you're trying to streamline permitting, and you're trying, and you, you, we all talk about making the approvals administrative mm -hmm. or streamlined, and usually that's a it, it's a large stumbling block. Yeah. But it sounds like that that in Bradenton, you you'd already had a history of vesting uh, administrative authority in, in people and they were comfortable with it and, and it was not an issue. And one of the things we did, uh, when that first chart I showed you in Article 1, we even gave, we, we, we talked about new roles and new rules. We also included new roles and new rules for the City Council, for our Planning Commission, for Architecture Review Board, 
So all those things changed to the point that we, we, we gathered more administrative approval, but also we, we also gave them more legislative approval as well as part of this whole process. So, so there was actually a, uh, this is astounding to me, but there, there's <laughs> actually, there was an actually a give back of discretion. And, right, and Karen? <laughs> in Florida? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think one of, the, one of the things that they were concerned about is that they didn't want to give away the store. That everything would be done administratively without a lot, a large amount of scrutiny uh, by, by the city council. And so we wanted to make sure, we assured them that number, that, number, that number one, that we were still going to be the friendly city, that we were, were not going to tie up development, uh, if, whether development or redevelopment, under this process. And at the same time, that they were, that they were going to be shortchanged. On, on, on their power and what they would do legislatively, uh, legislatively in terms of approvals. Are there any, uh, Anna, do you have a, an issue, a question? If you can talk, I know maybe I'm a little more familiar, I don't know how other states um, go through it, but I noticed also that you had to deal with the comprehensive plan and the zoning regulations, and it's not just to implement the zoning, but you also had to deal with other state regulations, and maybe you can talk a little more about it. One, early on, when I was going through the whole process of, uh, of, of adoption of form-based code, <clears throat> one of the things that we were required to do is do a comprehensive plan. And so we had to make sure, and even in our RFP and RFQ, we, wanted, we, we definitely stressed that. We wanted to make sure that anything that we would adopt under form-based code would not compromise our comp plan. So the, that was one of the first things that uh, we wanted to make sure that, that that happened because we have to, our comp plan really drives how we do development in, in the state of Florida. And so, like I said before, those kind of things to make sure we had consistency definitely had to be part of this whole process and it, and it, and it did and it was. Um, before, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> before coming to Florida, I, I also worked in Atlanta. I was the I was the commissioner of planning there for about four years, as well as the deputy commissioner. And, and, and Georgia, Georgia and Florida are a, a lot different uh, from that standpoint. But one of the things that, are, that, that, that is consistent is that the comp plan drives everything. And so we wanted to make sure that the form based code would comply with our comp plan, and it does. Uh, any, oh, uh, Carol? Uh, more, more from business. Uh, I think one of the pushbacks we had when I talked about the landscape standard, I'll let Andrew a panel on some of this too, <clears throat> was that we when we talked about lists and we talked about things like sustainability and how all this fits together in, in the terms of form-based code, a lot of people didn't understand that. And we were talking about the whole issue about turf grass and the whole issue about uh, Hurricane shutters and in uh, in the lighting and urban farming and all those kind of things. A lot of a lot of people don't understand it, including our elected officials. And so um, I think sometimes when I when I have a chance to talk to uh, talk to city council because I work for them, they trust me and I trust them. And so sometimes I say, "You just got to trust me. <laughs> it's going to be okay." Uh, but I think the biggest, the biggest pushback we got was from the, the, the growers and also a lot of these groups that we didn't know it, that we didn't even know existed. This came out of the woodwork when we started talking about plant lists. We started talking about categories and species and, and uh, we talked about uh, plants that, every, that a lot of growers had in their inventory that weren't native, that, that weren't native species plants. <laughs> it should be somewhere in South in, in, in South Florida or Northern Florida, or even, or even in the Pan, or even in the Panhandle, and so uh, when we start, when we start talking about plant lists, uh, uh, Andrew could probably help out this. We, we people just just start coming out of the woodwork. Andrew, yeah, just just very briefly uh, for all of the, those uh, uh, you may be familiar with the Florida condition. Florida uh, ecology is threatened by a lot of invasive exotics, which tend to disrupt. 
uh, ecosystems. And a lot of those plants, they get their starts at, 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 in, in urban context. So people plant a certain tree in their yard, and then a bird could take it a few miles, and suddenly uh, a 1,000 uh, acres of Everglades are, are invaded and disrupting a whole ecosystem. So we felt a responsibility to, since it's a, a, a Gulf Coast community, which is next to um, significant uh, um, uh, and pristine wilderness areas just to the east in Manatee County that we wanted to, to promote a pro-native a pro uh, species list. And so that's where a lot of that angst came through because there were a lot of growers that were, their whole business model depended upon a lot of uh, what was considered invasive exotic stock. And so they came out in full opposition to, to our code based upon, upon that thing. But so we, we hope that we uh, overcame that with the most com uh, complete list of plants, you know, for, ever done for a Florida code yet. Yes? Oh, for, yes, as Joe said, a, l a lot of homeowners and, 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 and others who, who are, are doing a landscape plan, either they're going to a nursery or to a big, big box like Home Depot or Lowe's. And what you, uh, we, we, we refer to these as just simply junk palms or junk species. And so you go in and you see queen palm and uh, sometimes Bismarck palm, and there's a few others that you choose from. And basically, it's, for, the whole state has these very few limited uh, uh, um, categories within each type of plant, whether it be a palm or a shrub or a tree, and and so some of these are they're they're commercially unavailable. But we felt that that wasn't a good enough excuse to keep uh, 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 allowing the status quo, which was those junk species, those invasive species. And so what we provided was the first ever list that that correlated the uh, exotic with a corresponding native that was similar in appearance. So we took the form-based code, form is more important than the use. We say that the form of the tree or the form of the species w w was even more important than its, uh, than its actual um, uh, genus. And so you can go into the list and find the commonly specced junk tree. So as soon as you get your landscape plan, you can, you can see it and then find the table what the native is that is the same uh, leaf habit or, or, or flower color or, or shape, and then you can uh, spec the native. So you can create an ecosystem automatically using those uh, translation tables between exotic and native. So, um, I, I'm Following up on that, um, to the extent there's been um, any pushback, we've heard about some of this, this pushback, how about acceptance? Uh, not just from the political um, folks, because they obviously had to pass it, but uh, potential applicants in the business community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, <laughs> unfortunately, some, some of the people in the business community can still consider this Tim Polk's code. <laughs> and I say it's not. It's really the city of Brainton. Uh, and I think, I, think it, I think a lot of it because it's a whole lot of trust in, in, involved. And, uh, and one of the things that is important to note uh, that City of Barrington, in doing the form-based code, we were able to do this, uh, be able to get adoption of the form-based code within nine months. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it could have been faster than that, but I, get, I got kind of scared. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and also the, the, a lot of the, the liberation with the, uh, uh, with the growers and the exotic uh, plant species folks and all the different groups that came out. Uh, but I, th I, think, I think the main thing, we got a little bit of pushback uh, when we, we talked about this. And, um, but I think what we're seeing right now, that people, people they'll, they'll say a developer will come in and do, do a development that's not even in a form-based code area. They, first thing they ask, am, am, am I in a form-based code area? I said, no, you're not in a form-based code area. You're, Is that right? you're not. But, but, but when, we, when we talk to people and we say that, okay, based on what you're going to do, you can do it by right and administratively, that means you don't have to go before a planning commission or a city council. They love it. They love it. And, and a lot of the things, and I think one of the things we tried to do early on uh, before we even brought phone based code before the city council, uh, as staff and myself, I, I personally worked a lot of the people in the business community, in the design community, to let them know that, again, this is, you don't have to be scared of it. This should, should allow you to be more innovative and creative right. and also be able to work with your clients even more so. 
and so um, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, there was a lot of give and take up front, and also getting everybody to prepare to get prepared to to look at form based codes as a means to uh, to protect and uh, and beautify our city. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay, with that, uh, thank you, Tim Polk. Oh, I'm sorry. Would, did you have any issues with uh, parking? Uh, parking, the parking requirements, or uh, how you dealt with that? And the other part that I would like, maybe if you can comment, is you also had bonuses. How, would, how were those received? Are people... Okay. Only if you want. Okay. <laughs> The, the pushback we had from parking standpoint was really when we talked about the thorough, thoroughfare standards, and um, and that was primarily with with internal staff, with the fire department in uh, in public works, uh, and they were basically uh, that's something that I learned when I was in Atlanta, uh, that when you talk about T and D and when you talk about new ur ur new urbanisms and all those kind of things, and a lot of those developments that were developed in Atlanta like. Uh, like Atlantic Station and also uh, Glen Glenwood Park. Uh, early on, we negotiated, you know, tooth and nail with these guys to make sure that they understand. And I think when we talked about, when I would talk to the fire department and, and, and public works department, I said we already have streets that are already now uh, pretty much the widths that we're promoting under form, on the form-based code with our, with our thoroughfare standards. Uh, and so. Uh, a, we were able to broker a deal uh, that we were that we would agree to to accept standards that we all can agree upon, and then any, if there's anything going to be varied from that, we would work with them. From the standpoint of the business community, uh, we haven't had that much pushback. Um, we've got a couple of developments right now. A lot of the a large amount of developments that are happening right now, the Riverwalk um, improvements uh, that are currently being done that will be finished by September roughly $17 million price tag that was under construction. And one other deal was a historic hotel called the Pink Palace that will start being restored in the next couple of months. They were, they were exempted from form-based code, but the Riverwalk improvements would follow form-based code standards. Uh, it has public art. It promotes uh, pedestrian movement. Uh, it, it also will follow a lot of the landscape standards that we have in the form-based code. And so some of these things are already started happening before we do that. And I think what, is, what has been important for the business community to understand is that they don't really have to be afraid of form-based code. It, again, it, it, get adds, it adds on, not take away. And one of the things that I, I try to do when we meet with applicants uh, that want to do development deals in the city that, that are currently under form-based code, uh, form code areas is I, I use a, a line that uh, Dewani used way back when, when he was uh, developing uh, Seaside. And I would tell them, I said, don't look at the form-based code as, as, a, as something that you can't do. Look at it as a way of something that you can do. And uh, oftentimes they they repeat that back to me, so you know, I can live with that. Thank you, Bob, Andrew, Tim. Um, and now, we, uh, for the concluding part of this session, I would like to introduce Dr. Emily Tallon. Um, and uh, she will be moderating a discussion, and we're going to have two people joining her, which would be Stefanos Polisoides um, and Elizabeth platter Cyberg, who should be joining us shortly. Thanks, Thanks Anna. Thanks for the diehards sticking it out here. But this is actually going to be a pretty interesting discussion, I think, so it's good that you stuck around. Um, because I think the selection of these two codes as the award winners sets up um, an interesting opportunity to compare and contrast why some elements are included in one and not the other, because they're both for existing small towns. I mean, they're 
uh, relatively similar areas being um, coded. And um, so one is obviously smart code, one is not smart code, but there are some similarities. I tried to boil it down to what I think are the three elements, and I'll just list them, and then um, Steph can go ahead and talk about these. He's had these uh, ahead of time. Perhaps he will be responding to these issues. Um, and there are three issues that I think um, come out in comparing these two and trying to get at the, um, the reasons for the differences. First, the question of scale. In the smart code, the transact zones tend to be um, rather small. I know that's kind of an ambiguous statement, but the point with the transect zones is to combine them to form complete neighborhoods. And in fact, the, some of the smart code people go ballistic if you try to define one transect zone, like T3, as a neighborhood, because that it has to be a combination of zones to form a complete neighborhood. So one question is, how does that compare with the Santa Ana character zones, which are not T zones in, in the smart code sense? Um, do they stand as complete neighborhoods, even though they're one zone? Um, are they grouped in some way to create neighborhoods? Is there a particular scale relevant for a character zone? Is there a particular scale relative for, to the transect zone? So I guess it's just about this question of scale. Um, second issue is about the spatial patterning of the zones. The zones in the Santa Ana Code um, are treated like transect zones, but the nomenclature is not really, as far as I understand it, about this kind of order or declension from more intense to less intense. Um, maybe it's implied in there, but I think we didn't see it as explicitly, so the question is, at what point does that explicit kind of um, more to less urban or rural come into play? How important is it? And how is it reflected in the arrangement of the zones? I think is another important question. Um, although both codes are for existing places, Bradenton seems to have more, um, seems to have been more focused on spatial patterning um, and maybe that's because they were dealing with these T-zones, um, these transect zones, which are smaller in nature. I think that might have helped with um, at least recognition of the spatial patterning going on. A third issue is about the regulation of building type. The SMART code regulates building type via private frontage, building height, setbacks function, in contrast, it seemed that the Santa Ana Code has tighter rules about building type and its integration, more restrictions on building form as opposed to envelope standards by setbacks and height. Um, it also specifies differing, differing heights by building type rather than T-zone. So when is one system better than another? What are sort of the pros and cons of those two approaches? Um, what can we learn from um, the two approaches to this? So with that brief overview about those three issues I'm hoping you'll touch on, I'll turn it over to Stephanos Polizoides. I hope I'll be able to plug in my computer because it is dying. And if it dies, I won't be able to talk to you. Oh, here we go. That's good. Um, uh, we're fine. Um, I certainly ap appreciate the opportunity to speak about the general issues today. I would like Karen and Tony to perhaps be involved in the discussions. We're going, we're going to have an hour approximately, right? Um, and with Liz Plate Zyberg speaking as well. Um, I don't want to begin before telling you that, that um, we can speak about codes, uh, you know, until the cows come home, but without Tim and Karen, there are no codes. I think this is the people you have to appreciate have put their lives into this. They have put the deep knowledge, deep curiosity, deep interest, and they've risked their jobs and their daily bread to get this to happen. They're advocates without whom this process would simply not have happened. I think you need to appreciate that, not only for this year's uh, uh, awards, but for last year's and the years before and for the ones to come. So 
I hope that you appreciate that, that uh, without personal interest and a deep long-term affection for the cities in which you live in and a deep understanding about why they need to change, no change ever happens. Having said that, um, I, I'm very happy to be taking the stand today here, and it's a little bit like a legal case, I guess. I use the word stand, uh, uh, you know, uh, poetically. Um, the story of, of the form-based code people and the, um, and, the, um, um, and the smart code people is a little bit like the story of the Montagues and the Capulets. Uh, there's been no murder yet, and there's been no suicide, certainly no double suicide, but we're getting damn close. There have been, uh, been bad allegations in the press. Uh, there have been strange happenings late at night in various parts of the country. And uh, th there is generally no love uh, or hate spared between these two parties, although nobody dares to, to uh, talk to each other openly about it. So in the best traditions of the CNU, I'm going to take my Andres Duani. You know when Andres sits around and does this all the time? It's very aggravating. He sits next to you and he's talking to you and he's doing this at the same time. He's writing down all his, all his, uh, all his current thoughts, you know, as, as, as he hears something and does something. So I'm going to simply read you my uh, Andres Duani list of, of what are the advantages and disadvantages as I see them of the smart code. And, um, and then if anybody wants to talk about, um, about smart form-based codes as a, as a different uh, species of the, of the capulet kind, uh, just you can go ahead and, and do that in the course of the discussion. The fact is, that, and I want to say this up front, that despite the, the sparring that is going on, um, there has been fantastic progress in the last couple of years. There has been extraordinary project, uh, progress in trying to understand how these how this, uh, issues can be resolved in, 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 in the public realm and how people can learn from each other and how, in fact, we are coming up with what is certainly a series of, of chassis, you know, a series of, 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 uh, of frameworks for understanding the, the issue of coding that can be idiosyncratic to, to various parties, and most importantly, and I'm, I'm glad to see Dan Solomon in the crowd, uh, idiosyncratic to the places uh, from which they spring. Because, you know, we live in a country in which uh, the law the law is really uh, in place, has been in place on a constitutional basis to uh, make sure that, that transactions and change in the urban environment happen based on, on a very orderly system of, of development and, and long-term visioning and planning. And in fact, how we go ahead to enable the system to happen to maximum advantage is a huge subject that we cannot avoid. So I would say first, that I'm, I'm deeply thankful for, for the work that has been done uh, by smart coders, including uh, the jokes that you made the other day uh, regarding the, the, the theological uh, connections between T3 and T4s in some remote corner of the universe. Uh, I would say this, that in principle, uh, the transect is, is a method, is a technique that allows us to, to understand something which has not been understood in a long time, which is that urbanism and the architecture of urbanism, the placemaking within urbanism is a nuanced subject. That it operates at various intensities from center to edge, but also at various intensities within precincts. And it is culturally diverse in different parts of the city and in different countries. So I would call, I would call the smart code sort of the gold standard of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, co of the understanding of both the need for and a method for coding. But I would not use the word code for it. The word code applied to the smart code in generic form is a misnomer. It really should be called a matrix. It is really the most complete encyclopedic view of what are the essential elements of an urbanism. And the problem begins, and this is my second point, that um, the second point is that, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I jumped to criticism. I meant to say the good things first. I'll continue with the good things. Um, the, the, we were involved recently in a, in a, a smart code-based uh, project in El Paso for two projects, actually 200 and 300 acres. The fact that there was in place a, a, a very complex and expansive set of thoroughfares that allowed us to make a composition uh, that immediately rendered a set of blocks and a set of lots within blocks was nothing short of a bloody miracle. 
Uh, the fact was that we've been through projects in the last 20 years, some of us, in which we had to fall on our knees in front of uh, community uh, development and or uh, public, public works directors, including in Santana, to allow us to do the, just the smallest thing. And here we had the widest range of enabling street types, thoroughfare types, that anybody could ever hope for. So we got an urbanism within five minutes, people, and the fact was that we didn't need the 500, the 500 uh, pages of, of, uh, of, the, uh, um, of the ND, the lead ND uh, book, which is absurd. We could do it with a pencil on paper in five minutes. Think about how important that is as, as, as a gift to, to, our, uh, to our discipline. The other thing was that this project in, in, in El Paso, from the day we were hired, to the day that it was entitled, uh, and, and it was, it's being entitled on Monday, actually, through the City Council, uh, is only a period of six and a half months for a project which is approximately three and a half thousand uh, units of housing and a million square feet of, of commercial space. I would call that in, in Republican parlance deregulation. This is really a remarkable step. It's a remarkable step in the history of our country that we can actually do this. To give you an idea about how screwed up the world is, I was telling somebody the other day, I had a planning commission meeting in Santa Monica last week, the first planning commission meeting on 20 units of housing, and it's been four and a half years since we began. Right, Karen? So th that actually for appreciation of what these instruments represent in the aggregate. I would say that the focus on, 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 on forming a, a, a public realm incrementally that, is, 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 that this, this instrument uh, is based on and is focused on is also a gift. It's an important gift because there's no question about the fact that, that block form is really the, the Rosetta Stone of urbanism and this, this, this instrument enables it. And finally, because it is so varied, it is varied by six zones, but there's always the possibility of subdividing the zones into subzones. There is such a possibility for, for focusing on on detail that it's entirely possible to understand and appreciate uh, a nuanced approach to placemaking. So that is the present, I think, that we should all be uh, very, very thankful for. So for things that don't work, and I think here, here uh, I, I was a little bit apprehensive and confused, first because I'm going to be critical, and secondly because half of these issues have to do with the instrument itself, and the other half of the instrument has to do with those that, that, that uh, that uh, actually practice it. It's like, uh, is, uh, do guns kill people or do people kill people? It's one of those kinds of issues, you know. Uh, but I, I, will, I will say those things anyway. And you, you can, in the course of discussion, we can begin to unravel them and hopefully uh, end up after two years with, with a peace treaty or some kind or another. The first thing is, and that's a classic address to one issue, this, this instrument over-promises. Um, I think that, I think that, that um, that zoning is about patience. It's about really leading the way through minefields in the political realm. It is not about cities buying it or accepting it or adopting it, and then all of a sudden it's all over. You know, just, just buy it, you know, sign up right here and you're saved. It's not one of those scenes. And yet, I have to say, in places, I have heard. I have heard indirectly and a couple of times directly that uh, it has been promoted that way. And I think in, in unison with this idea, or in, 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 um, in connection with this idea, every instrument has a bias. Every single instrument has a bias built into it. And I think the bias of the smart code is actually a greenfield bias. And I would like to imagine that the, the, that the bias of coding should be on the entire spectrum. Can you actually imagine a smart code uh, for uh, the projects that, that Steve Peters showed, showed yesterday in Berlin, for instance, and Barbara Littenberg? Is it possible to actually imagine that kind of instrument that allows us to go from single family houses in the Midwest to, uh, to, uh, to the center of Berlin, to the center of the Großstadt? The answer is yes, but when Andres spoke yesterday, and I think some of you might have heard him, he said that the instrument renders in its uncalibrated form a Midwestern city. Which one and why and at what intensity? Why should the smart code be anything else other than a matrix in which it bears absolutely no numbers and it's neutral across the board? Why should it be anything else? I'm asking. Thirdly, um, 
the dependence on frontage standards absolutely underplays architectural typology. And we've reached a, we reached a point in the history of the CNU, and this is a subject for the next 20 years, that the good plan is a dime a dozen, but the Kayala is a one in a thousand. And we cannot continue this way. We, we are, we're going to lose the promise of what, what we're betting to the world. We're betting to the world not good plans and good planning. We're betting to the world the, 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 the issue of a, of a beautiful and just and, 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 and completely usable and, and, and adaptable place to, urban place for all of us to live in. And this cannot be done without architecture. And this cannot be done with taking some responsibility for actually the city block, which is really the, the Rosetta Stone of urbanism, that which, which stands between the street and the, and the individual building. So to say that we, we, can, we can control a city by just, but just suggesting that the edges of blocks are all we have to worry about is actually not right, particularly when, when we have actually taken entirely away the subject of, of FAR-based entitlement, and the entitlement is done on the basis of certain types. Which types? And what are the rules for each type? And how does these types work to, with each other in a compatible fashion, whether they're in a greenfield from scratch or in a city together, to actually give us some, some, some version of city which could be on a spectrum, homogeneous or heterogeneous, as we choose to, 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 to design it. But how, do we, how can we do this without understanding the issue of a range of types and the combination of these types that give us a coherent block, coherent blocks and therefore a coherent city. I think that, that the, the idea that, that the, and this is another bias of the instrument, the idea that, that a, a code exists which is really a matrix is on the one hand unbelievably enabling, but on the other hand it really has to be calibrated and in many instances this calibration errs on the side of, uh, of, uh, errs on the side of translating the existing condition into a vision for the future. And I think this is a fundamental project, I think, for all, for all coding. I don't want to, to pin this on, on the smart code alone. The fact is that we began as an institution that's attempting to repair the city, okay? And, and in order to repair the city, we have to understand its DNA. In order to understand its DNA, we have to actually isolate the, the types and recombine them in the form that we know works well. But this actually, I would like to, 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 to claim, is half of our responsibility. The other half of the responsibility is to understand how the city evolves over time and what types and what combination of types are necessary to put into place in order to deliver it to the next phase and to the next and to the next. So when I see codes that translate the existing condition into the vision for the future, I get immediately paranoid because I see in that condition just simply a, a, a duplication of, the, of, of, a, of a reasonable existing condition without absolutely any ambition for changing the city into what it could become, which is always an unknown and which is something that the CNU should be absolutely vitally interested in. The unknown we should be interested in as much as the known. And actually the unknown is what uh, both uh, Dan and Andres were talking about yesterday when they were discussing uh, the issue of the idiosyncratic and and the six hues of, of red. That is the unknown. And, and lastly, um, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a, as I said, it's my interest to any um, list of issues over, over uh, 10 years over the subject. The last one, and before I, 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 I see the microphone to, to Liz, which as I can see is here, is that there is strangely an absence of form, of, of, of regulation in, in the, in the, in, in smart codes by neighborhood, district, and corridor. Uh, there, is, there is certainly uh, pedestrian shed discussions. There is all kinds of discussions that, that, pre that, that present um, um, versions of, 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 uh, of, of zoning boundaries that are, that are reasonable and important. But particularly in dealing with existing cities, I see very little evidence that um, that there is care to, to, to understand the actual literal spatial uh, limits of places, particularly the ones that don't fall within the, 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 the procrustory and kind of uh, predetermined uh, quarter mile, which might be a little bit less or a little bit more. Uh, and also because by avoiding the, this kind of, de of, of, of designation, we're avoiding, I think, some of the sharpest 
issues of transformation that, that our country faces. Because I think it will be fair to say, as far as I'm concerned, that probably 80% of the challenge that we face in the future is not fixing downtowns or fixing neighborhoods, but fixing corridors. And the corridor situation in our country is a bloody disaster. I mean, it's a bloody disaster. And not only because of what corridors are, but because of the completely, uh, the completely um, uh, terrible effect that they have on the, on the neighborhoods and, and districts that they, that they front. Or, or, or that the neighbor. So I, I, I want to see, I want to believe that, that it is possible to, um, to actually use some of the more, most typical new urban is, instruments that we have to actually return to a much more place-based and reality-based approach to how this business is done. And one of the reasons why, and if I can say one last thing, which has to do with nomenclature to, to support the, this last point, one of the reasons we don't use T1s, T3s, T4s, T5s, T6s in our work is because not we, because we don't believe in, in, in this kind of range of, of intensity or intermediate other range of intensity, but because we think this kind of, 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 uh, of planning jargon, you know, this kind of uh, nerdist view to, of the world that is actually perfectly acceptable within this group because we need to co co communicate with each, with each other is completely irrelevant outside these walls. So we much prefer to call things, you know, uh, bungalow heaven uh, for, 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 for a neighborhood in Pasadena which bears that name or any other neighborhood that, that in, on a greenfield side might have a similar name. We believe in calling things names that are actually relevant to those that inhabit them. And, and uh, maybe sometimes and often we put T3 in parenthesis. But you will find that our approach is, is place-based in a very aggressive way in trying to understand what places are how they change, and, and, and how they can be brought into the realm of, of, uh, of appreciation, use, and long-term um, uh, utility and importance, the symbolic importance, by, by being taken to people's hearts. I think that, that, is, that is the piece, I think, that is most, most, important, uh, most important of all. And I think both, both uh, uh, Karen and Tim spoke about this, I think, extremely clearly. The instrument matters, but how the, matter, the, the, the instrument is executed, uh, how it actually realizes the, the, the complexity of form that our complexity of, of, of an evolving life demands is really the essence of the subject. So the, the, our, our goal, I think, is what these instruments deliver, not what these instruments are. So I will leave you with that, and hopefully um, we, can, we can speak with, uh, uh, with the Montagues um, in, in continuation. Thank you. at a disadvantage here because I didn't hear the two presentations of the codes um, and I walked in as Steph was already speaking I but I didn't speak to this the codes I didn't speak to this the codes I spoke in general but you you, you had presentations before yeah, this right, I think. I and I, I, but I, I knew that I was coming in um, in this manner um, so um, you know and maybe I'll just pick up the end of, uh, Steph's ending and uh, start reeling backwards and that way I'll stay out of trouble um, you talked about what is delivered is important, but I think part of the discussion that you're missing is who's delivering it and how it's being delivered. Because um, I think everyone agrees that we have a variety, we've developed a variety of instruments um, uh, across the years in this organization um, that are intent on um, not exactly delivering the same thing, but um, presenting the same goals. Um, tailored to many different conditions, uh, needs, starting points, and so on. Um, in my introduction to the form-based code book, uh, I pointed out that there was a tremendous variety of form-based codes, uh, and some of them were um, controlling street space, some of them were controlling building type, some of them were controlling a combination of that, uh, and then at the far and then. Some of them are uh, um, accommodating uh, existing zoning at one end of the scale, at working in existing places, and others are presenting um, pattern books, which are telling you very precisely how to design a building. And I think we should understand that that is the full range. 
Um, it's going from improving the old-fashioned zoning code um, so that it begins to control um, issues of public space, um, mixed use, compactness. Um, at one scale and at the other scale, it's being very precise about building quality. And in between are all the other things we are trying to achieve or the, um, the goals that are uh, presented in the charter of the new urbanism, in the policy goals of, the, of smart growth and so on. Um, yes, and it's very clear that each one of these instruments in each one of these places is about tailoring. I call it couture, not off the rack. Um, uh, but at some point, the who is implementing it is a kind of off the rack condition. It is many communities which have um, small capacity to spend money on us, on the consultants who can um, do fabulous tailoring, um, that are just seeking to improve their condition and work within uh, an, indis an existing context. Um, and I think that's where the smart code comes in. Um, because it is trying to present that middle ground um, of how you can, um, in some larger perspective of region and community, um, develop places within existing legal frameworks that allow you to control private building. Um, and is it, um, it, w it may not produce Windsor, it may not produce one of the places that you're involved in, but it's way ahead of Playa Vista, which we both worked on, in which the architects were resistant to coding. Um, and Playa Vista is a Santa Monica project that had an incredible opportunity. We did develop a street grid, um, but there was, in fact, in the end, the idea was the architects would control the quality of the place. We had beautiful drawings. The, by the way, the neighbors knew. They said, what guarantee is there that this is going to be the kind of place that your drawings are showing us. Um, and uh, the team said, well, it'll be the architects. Well, lo and behold, Goldman Sachs bought it. And yes, there are architects who are involved, um, but it is a place of dismal architectural quality. And um, we have, some of us have regretted that it did not receive at least some minimal generic and general code. So, these, the smart code and any kind of coding, um, uh, I think, do not replace an excellent plan, and that's part of the picture. Um, they cannot necessarily alter a pre-existing plan, um, and they can, and they indeed need to be tailored. So Sandy Sorlane is sitting in the room, the master of calibration, um, of doing the calibration exercises um, that allow the smart code to um, be tailored to, its, to the condition that there, that there might be in, an, in a specific place. Um, Miami 21, uh, which I am most familiar with, um, is actually a hybrid. The smart code was incredibly useful as a foundation for putting away an existing zoning code and, and allowing a city to start over. But in fact, in the course of its evolution, it reincorporated some of those existing zoning issues. Anna's here. <laughs> um, uh, the planning director from the city is sitting on my right. Um, uh, because there is a, there's always a history. Um, they're long fought uh, and, and with great difficulty fought battles, um, uh, victories that neighbors have achieved um, or other characteristics of a place that need to be accommodated. So I don't know how Steph's presentation began, and I don't want to um, uh, make this, I wasn't expecting a presentation, actually. Um, I don't want to make this a defensive um, presentation, because I think Andres probably did a good job of that yesterday. But I would um, point out one, uh, a couple of other things that he referred to. I was struck, I've always admired the, lit, uh, the Peterson Littenberg plans. I don't know how many of you saw them yesterday. But I was struck, not having seen them for a long time uh, and seeing them again, how little they were engaged with, they were certainly beautiful what, what you wanted to achieve, but how little they were engaged with who or how it would be implemented. Um, because these were about building masses for the most part um, without any idea of how that would be cut up in terms of property ownership 
Um, would it be subdivided? Were there underlying property lines? If it was the public space that was being made into buildings, how you would parcel that out? Um, and in the end, the disappointment they felt by the buildings that were built on their plans because they had drawn the architecture but they hadn't in any way guided it through regulations, um, I think was a quite convincing about the need for that. So yes, the SMART code was developed largely for Greenfield um, uh, building, for understanding how to code places differently than we have been before. And maybe there needs to be a high density SMART code, although um, we took a stab at it in um, the city of Miami. Uh, and I know that Philadelphia has been working on that too. Um, uh, but I think it's an incredibly important tool, and I would be worried if the attacks on the SMART code were leaving this room. As Steph said, we all have a certain understanding of, some th of, of common knowledge, but um, if you just go out there to the people who probably don't even know what typology is and start saying this code doesn't, you know, is not a valid way to control the built environment, I don't think we're serving anyone's purpose um, among those who um, may just need the simple tool that it can present um, to make places better places. So I think I'll stop here. You probably want a discussion more than presentations. Well, I think um, we want to make sure we really get the audience engaged here, but um, one issue that I guess I'll just lead the way with how we're going to have the battle proceed. Um, we've got a mic there. I mean, Liz, how do, you, how do you respond to Steph's point that the smart code is not actually a code? Because that's really how he started his presentation. Um, he sees it as more of a matrix of possibilities than an actual code. And I wonder what your response is. Um, well, it's certainly functioning as a code in a number of communities. So um, maybe we should ask some place that thinks it's a code why it's not. Well, the, the, point, the point I was making uh, was not only my point, but I started by describing um, words and issues and, and, and perceptions that are floating around in ether. And I, I was just making the point that the smart code as a generic instrument is not a code. It is really a series, it's an encyclopedic series of extraordinarily well-coordinated issues. That, that, that really, code? Is code? A, a code is an, is, is an actually, is an, apply, an instrument applied to the conditions of a particular place guiding its growth over time. So how can you say that it's not a code? Because Andres himself yes, said yesterday that, that the, the code left to its generic form uh, delivers a Midwestern town. He said that in exactly that way in response to, to your comments, Dan. So, I, I, and the reason why... So that's a code, even if it's delivering a Midwestern town. Yeah, but it is, man, it is meant to then be transformed into all kinds of other things. And, and, and the, the transformation part of it is what the codes are. But the most important thing about it is it is really a matrix is, uh, I'm using the word, in the, the word in, the, in the Roman sense, it is the mother of all codes. It, it's, it's a compliment, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a criticism. No, that's right, I don't need to get no. because you all heard it. No, I started by speaking about the five extraordinary things about the code. Yeah, okay, that's what I missed. Is it possible to walk around with this? No. We've got a lot of hands up, so Dan Solomon. I didn't, I didn't speak critically, I spoke, I spoke supportively and then posed the questions that are really floating in the corridors. I, I can't hear you, Dan.
respond to that? Well. Uh, okay, uh, being recorded. So Dan Solomon is asking, why does the smart code have to claim to be um, universally, universally applicable and comprehensive? And I, I think the smart, I, I need to be kind of neutral here because I was on the jury, but um, does, do either of you want to respond to that? And by the way, if you have a question, come on up here and grab the mic and um, state your question. Well, uh, you know, I think that it is, and um, I think Andrew should be given a chance to speak to this as well, but um, there is a kind of, the universality, I think, is that it's dealing with universal issues of coding, and it is attempting to be useful in the most, in the, in the most, broad sense of needy places in the manner that zoning exists in the country now, which is essentially um, without planning, without real planning. I was in a very interesting session, paper session, the other day, yesterday, I guess, uh, in which um, the two federal acts which implemented governments laying out streets and governments um, uh, laying out zoning was explained by um, uh, a Georgia Tech PhD, actually someone who works for historical concepts. And it was very interesting because it showed that zoning remained with us, but the act of um, a public planning and laying out the streets does not. Um, and that they were always seen as a parallel um, endeavor. And so given the fact that the private sector has taken over um, the one and the public sector still remains with the other, it's a much more complex picture, but um, this is a tool that's attempting to help people do both. So, um, yes, it does have claims um, of trying to be as broadly applicable as possible, but as the architects in Miami pointed out when we were working on it, wouldn't it be more desirable to be doing the plan first and then tailoring the coding by neighborhood, which may have something to do with its history or... Um, uh, some other kind of uh, generated form. And yes, that would be ideal if you could get to that degree of tailoring, but most places do not have the luxury to do that much planning, that much design. And so we do end up working with things that are, let's say, somewhat blunter instruments in the, in the attempt to be useful. No, from one Greek to another. <laughs> um, no more Greek, or <laughs> Roman. Um, oh, but maybe I'm sure. facing the wrong way. Um, the um, w one one other thing that that we, I also feel uncomfortable with the the sort of smart code against, or you know the the the, the other the other format. A lot of us who are regular coders um, are actually using many of the different methods, as, as you mentioned, depending upon the co context of the, the, the culture. For instance, uh, when we work with uh, Farrell Madden, uh, we often code by, by street type, uh, not only because that's some of the, the preferred method of our partner in that case, but also because in, in the places where we work, they're more familiar with, with that convention. And then else, elsewhere, we may use the transect, and then elsewhere, we, we may use a, a, a building type or, or character place driven code. So in no way are we saying uh, that, that, that smart code is to the exclusion of all those others. At least I, I, speaking for our own firm, I, I don't know about others how they feel who may be a little bit more uh, defensive of it. Um, the other thing is, is that another question we often get is what is meant by calibration? So in the crudest, crudest form of the word, calibration is, is changing those pieces of text in your template to, uh, to, to bring them up to a locally acceptable metric or, 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 or change the word, right? So when you see a smart code or another template which is uncalibrated and you see those blue words, you change it depending upon the metric of, of the desired outcome in your community. Well, th we also are not comfortable with that, that usage of the word calibration. When we calibrate a code, we don't like just to change the text, but we like to, 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 promote, to go much farther than that, sometimes creating new tables, creating, uh, replacing entire bodies of text, even the one that's not colored blue. 
if that's what's needed to capture the local character of that place. So just, just, just to clarify when we mean calibration, it doesn't mean only one type of thing. And um, we think that a lot of the confusion arises from, from that, that mis misunderstanding about what is, the, what is calibration and how does one calibrate in a specific community. And thank you. Steph, you okay with that? That sound good? No, I, I want to return to the, to, to the previous point, if I can, and, oh, and sure. take the second one as well. Uh, but Dan's point, I, I think the universality uh, is, is, is what allows me to accept the, the, the smart code as a matrix because it is really the most comprehensive instrument that we have that asks every relevant question about how you construct a, a, a built environment. It is the most important one that we have. We can subtract from it, you can add to it, but it, it allows you to, to not so much uh, uh, necessarily imagine a place made that way, but it, it allows you to think more broadly about what might or might not be an ingredient. And then the way in which you, you, uh, you work it into the making of a place is, um, is absolutely idiosyncratic and based on, on where you are and how you are. That's certainly the way we did it in our own code in, uh, in, um, in Santa Ana and beyond. So I, I don't think there's anything that is controversial about this issue. I think that's mainstream uh, form-based code uh, into thinking as well. Hi, I'm Sandy Sorling, and I was really interested, Steph, um, when you suggested that the matrix that is the smart code not be filled in, that if we were really customizing, calibration means custom you're customizing the code for a specific place, and all the things that Andrew spoke about and, and more. Um, and I just want to present, from my point of view, as someone who is not an architect, not an urban designer, you know, not an AICP, um, but am steeped in American towns like crazy and uh, local character, and that's what I care most about, that it's really helpful to me when I'm calibrating to have a filled-in smart code that was done by architects and, and planners and urban designers who are the best and uh, the, the transportation engineers and so forth, that, that to have this model for me to push against when we're down there, you know, when the team is actually stepping off, measuring, photographing, um, you know, evaluating the types, and then to compare it to the model, see why it's different from the model, and, that, and you learn something from that, as well as to uh, catch yourself if you're making some kind of error, you know, it's way off for some reason. Um, and, and for that reason, I really appreciate that it's, it's already a code. Thank you. Okay, so now we're getting into everybody's wonderful and we're all one big happy family, which is no fun. We want to get down to the, the brass tacks. Okay, come on so up here. We'll fix that. <laughs> yeah. Everything is not all right. It's a, <clears throat> um, I, I'm, I'm not someone who's, who's uh, I haven't read the smart code for a long time, and it changes all the time, but Liz, there are problems. One of the, the key things that you were both talking about, the idea of not planning, zoning without planning, the city of Mudville copies the zoning ordinance written in 1962 of the neighboring city that might be a little bit bigger and starts using it, the problem of planning, and I think at the same time, then, you also talked about those communities that can't do the Cadillac vision plan followed by the calibrated or the Couture code. And I think one of the things that's happening is that the smart code is, is by promising to make it easy for you to adapt without the planning, I think it it's, seems to be fostering that same thing, and it's falling in that same pattern. Uh, and I think that's problematic, and I'm, I'm someone who likes the idea of model codes. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in that, and I don't want to dismiss it, but somehow I think it's, this is not working. And I, think, and I think that there's a corollary problem is that it has its own 
universe of jargon that has somehow started out decamped from the reality, legal, constitutional, etc., of current zoning practice. And it kind of just tries to float above a lot of those issues. And some of this is old information, but the danger of jargon and also the danger of promising to make it easy when it doesn't. Thank you very much. Well, if you didn't promise to make it easy, would anybody use it? Yeah. But, no, Jeff, I, um, I think what you're saying can be taken as a challenge. And uh, there, if we respond to a lot of the criticisms, of course it sounds defensive. I think we should say, yes, th of course it could be better or perhaps by its mere existence, it has pointed out what the next step that could be taken was. But it's like so many things that I think have, we have achieved in the new urbanism, was that we've been very realistic and pragmatic along the way about what was the next achievable step depending on who and how it was being implemented. So I always present a picture of a photograph of houses at Kentlands and say, this is the same suburban house that the builder was accustomed to building on the cul-de-sac. All we did was ask them to bring it closer to the street and put the garage in back. But the floor plan that he, was, he or she were selling remained the same. Now, of course, the architects were saying, you know, what a failure. You didn't improve the, the architecture. So maybe that's happening along the way. There's a big difference between from Seaside to Alice Beach, which is one place that that transition has occurred. So th I would say this is a challenge for the next best model code to emerge in reaction to the smart code. So that was the first step that was taken. It was dealing with uh, kind of existing conditions in, I guess Bradenton is our version of a Midwest city in Florida, right? Um, and say, all right, so this is what we've learned from it. Is there a model code for high-density cities like downtown Miami? Downtown Miami, but Miami probably deserved three different codes based on three different cities which are there. But there's one zoning code, you know, that the city's accustomed to having. And design review doesn't work. You know, people asked for design review to try to get better architecture. That was something we could not add to it. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's take the criticism and say, what's the next version? I, I, I want to just add one small thing, George. Uh, to Sandy's point, which I, um, I respect, I understand very well, uh, but I want, to, I want to put forth a small practical knot that exists out there, and that is that as more and more people want to do this and there's less and less time, energy, and particularly money to do it, the, there is a danger that the, that the normative view of the matrix becomes the code by default. That's a very serious problem. And I think all of us from an ethical point of view, not in our relationship to each other, but in a relationship in a Hippocratic sense, a relationship to our clients, need to be very aware that for $60,000, uh, or, or 80, depending on the size of the city, you cannot deliver a tailored code. And therefore, I think one of the things we have to face is that for that amount of money, we can deliver a code that is calibrated but without public process. Something has to give. And at the point at which you have public process and 400 or 1400 hours of contact with, with staff, then at that point, you're dealing with another universe. And I think that's a responsibility that we all have to make sure that the normative instrument does not become the law of the land, whatever, whatever piece of the land we're dealing with. But aren't you saying, Steph, that in, if people can't afford to do the tailoring, then nothing should happen? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying What's that, the alternative? I'm saying that th there, are various, there should be various ways of delivering the services, and I think that I started by saying that one of the critical issues of the smart code is overpromising because I think that, that you cannot deliver the same quality of service everywhere. But then you're saying, you're saying, 
I, I still read that as saying, if you can't afford to tailor, to give a tailored regulation, matrix, whatever you want to call it, then you shouldn't try to improve the condition with another, a new norm. No, I'm saying that, that you need to, you need to uh, make a, uh, give a service or provide a service that's proportional to the, the resources available and not be, and not find yourself in the temptation of making the normative version. So the, what would the, you do for the, the small normative town that can afford $50,000? Just, just, uh, just, hire go Jeff ahead. can you answer the question? I'm sorry. That, I, think, I think the list, the, the question, and I don't think the floor is $80,000, but maybe it's close. But I think, Liz, your, your question, to answer that, you know, the, the person who can't afford $50,000, there is some floor below which you can't do something, and maybe giving someone a code that isn't right for their town is not a service. So it, it is... So, so you're both right. I'm sorry I said that. It, se it, seems, it, seems, it seems too nice. But you're, but you're both right. But I think that's the focus of the question. There's a floor. And it's not $12,000, as some people are saying up in New England. You know, there are, there are limits. And it's not $30,000. That's something you mail in. Yeah, and I do think we need to get it out of the realm of that there's a consultant in the room who needs to be paid. Uh, because actually the code is out there in such a way that if a small town um, or a county or some municipal government had staff and a little bit of time to work with it, that they can do that without a consultant. Well, I would accept that only if there was a red line on top that said, you know, don't do this at home without parental... Uh, in, uh, no, it uh, says do this without parental. Go ahead, use it. Isn't that the point? No, that... Uh, Well, of course. Yeah. The so code says use a landscape architect. It's so architect very complicated too. that you might end up with a Midwestern town everywhere in the U.S., including Manhattan, you know. That's the problem. That's, that's Dan Solomon's po point of yesterday. So I'll, I'll dive into the middle of this, if I may. Um, and, and Jeff got to the beginning of sort of what I was going to ask when I first stood up, because I, I've been involved in this issue in New England for a while, and we had these extensive discussions amongst the new urbanists in New England. If we could find a way to disconnect the process that seems to be best done by a local planner who knows the parties and everything else from the actual creation of a code document that could be done for a lot less money than having a consultant spend all the time doing the process. And Andres made the comment yesterday about, you know, for $7,000 we could calibrate the smart code if we knew what we were calibrating it to. And um, I thought that was all interesting, but I, I, I'm still there's a perplexing problem to me with the smart code itself as it relates to being the particular tool that can do that, particularly in New England places where the interesting difference to some extent is that the issue we're trying to change in codes is not necessarily um, to merely make it possible to teach people how to do good urbanism again because that stuff is usually all around you in the existing context there, um, but in reality to sometimes take people who seem to have lost the clue as to how to do that and sort of push them all the way into doing it. And what I worry is merely dropping the smart code onto a New England pattern as a, as a, um, as a model that seems to do a good job of making the option of good urbanism available, but I'm not sure that the frontage without the calibrated architecture gets you to the point where you necessarily make it the default that nobody else can, can deviate away from. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's two other challenges there, one of which is that um, the language of it is still, as somebody who spent 10 years working in a planning office, completely mysterious to me in terms of how it works in our local character. And maybe someone needs to do one in Massachusetts first, and then I'll understand how it can work for us. But then, and the, the third thing is that the language is still, it still doesn't solve the one problem I'm trying to solve with our existing code, which is actually making it readable to someone who doesn't spend their time hanging around in rooms talking about codes all the time. Um, and, and I really like, like one of the most fundamental things we started doing when I've worked on new codes is actually naming districts to describe exactly what actually we want to go there. And, and the T letters are great for us, all of us to have conversations amongst ourselves, but they don't quite convert to that. So, 
I, I mean, I, I think it leads to a question that Jeff just about touched on, which I hadn't really thought about. We really only have one model form-based code at this point, and I guess I'd be curious of people's perceptions of this. Is it, is the answer that, is one potential answer maybe that we just need more models in that, you know, we've only one group has stepped forward and presented itself with a model and said, here's a model, you can calibrate this. Maybe there's a different type of model that we should be working to calibrate. And if we had three or four of these, we could figure out whether or not one is more appropriate for a given context. And, and that that's really the problem we're stuck with. And I don't know if that's the answer, but that was sort of my thought after going into all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oops. Interesting question. Do you want to respond to that? Well, I, I, think, I think that's a very great challenge and a very good challenge. And I think what you're seeing in some of these, some of these uh, presentations, and I don't mean t today's presentations, but maybe the last two or three years of presentations, is really an emerging number of, of possible codes by different offices. I mean, one of the most interesting things is that most of this work is three years old. And, and these are evolving, these are evolving uh, platforms. We have more than one platform. And I think this discussion is going to continue over the next years because we're going to be seeing more and more refined versions of these kinds of, of, uh, of approaches. And I think it is a very healthy and a very important thing. And some of them might actually be much more calibrated by, more generically calibrated for particular regions of the country. Others might be by far more uh, attached to particular contexts or kinds of contexts. Who knows how these things evolve in the future? But uh, the great thing is that they were, you know, uh, five years ago, there were one and a half firms that could do this. At this particular point, there is 10, and maybe uh, 10 years from now, there's going to be 30 or 50. So we're going to see va variation, and I think that's, that actually is a, is a very welcome thing. We're going to see different models. I think we're going, this is going to happen, George, I believe. Next question. Thank you. For one of the guys that, that's in the weeds of uh, going through four base code, um, we had we had some we had some concerns uh, initially uh, being close to Brayden and being close to Sarasota and the Tampa Bay region. We studied all the the form based code documents and all the uh, and all the form based codes that were adopted before us in Miami and also in Sarasota. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that that it it didn't become a contentious problem in a, in in Bradenton. Um, the SRQ Magazine Business Journal did an article when we, we were in the process of adopting the form-based code, I think this is right after we adopted it, adopted it in June of last year, called Coded Future, the Friendly City Tackles Contentious Planning. <laughs> this is following up what happened in, what, what happened in Sarasota. Uh, when we were doing RFQ, RFP process, uh, and we were, we were getting close to selecting uh, a consultant, uh, we sent out our, our RFPs, RFQs to roughly 60 uh, planning uh, firms that did form-based code. Um, and then we got uh, about 28 responses back. And then we narrowed it down to 10, a short list of 10. Uh, I was very fortunate that, uh, and blessed that uh, the short list involved four firms uh, that I had somewhere previously in my planning and professional life had worked with, and uh, with Dover Cole, uh, DPZ, uh, also uh, UDA, whether in Atlanta, whether in Little Rock, whether in Garland, Texas, where I met Victor and, and, and Joe. Um, so I had a pretty good knowledge of what, what these guys do in their body of work, so being able to do that as well as working with uh, Dewani in, uh, in Atlanta uh, and also in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. I think one of the things that we, we were sort of taken back when we talked about smart code was that we were, we were concerned that we didn't really want a cookie cutter code. Uh, and so we were taken back a little bit from that standpoint. Um, I think we were looking at, uh, they have a term in the African American community, a clover called FUBU, for us, by us, that we wanted a code that would maybe meet the template, but be for us, by us. And so that's why it was very important that we had community engagement. That's why we had making sure that we have all the stakeholders that would buy into it. And that why, that's why that, that thing that uh, the, sh the uh, shaping the code process, working with the Dover Code team, 
where they brought out the community and the communities out there in the weeds shaping the code was important. Because normally, I hate to say, tell you guys, uh, but zoning is very dull. <laughs> people don't like it. <laughs> and it's very hard to get people to come out and, and talk about it because it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand. But, w but when you get to the point, and that's something that the, that the, that the Congress and the need, need to be looking at, how do, you, how do you get true community engagement to let people know that they need to be involved in this process to make this thing work? And, uh, and what uh, Dover Cole and their team did with, in, in their threat process in shaping the code where people actually got to understand what zoning meant and what zoning means and how if you don't do it right, zoning can screw your city up. And so I'd like to see more and more of the interest institute uh, looking toward that because I did a lot of, I did a lot of, personally, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of research uh, in the form-based code. I bought the books, I bought the uh, T-shirt, coffee mug, <laughs> read the tapes, <laughs> looked at the DVD, <laughs> but I didn't understand it until actually we adopted it. And we got into the weeds and, and got to the point of making it work in our cities and making it work in our city. So that's something, uh, that's, my, that's my comments in terms of smart code. But I support smart code. Uh, I think it, with some, uh, with some improvements, I think it can work. But it needs to be a point where everybody understands and everybody can be part of this. That's my comments. Thank you. Well, just one quick comment. I think what you're pointing out in a sense is that any zoning code is not a sharp instrument. You will always find um, that it has to evolve, that some of the words got wrong, you, you know, just some of the language doesn't work. And that's why the codes that we're reacting to, I think this, is, this was the case in Miami, it had been there for what, 20 years already or more, and just layered on of adjustments to changing conditions. And so there is a, a factor of, of time of, that will occur and tailoring over time. And to some degree, this, I think this whole emergence of form-based codes now, um, besides the paradigm and change in what it is that we want, how we want cities to be pedestrian friendly rather than auto friendly or all the things that are the kind of big change, um, also has to do with the fact that these things are so, we don't work on them. We don't think of planning and zoning and working on our, the physical environment as a kind of ongoing management issue. You think the code's going to go in and it's got to be perfect and it's going to last for 20 years, you know, and everybody's going to be happy. But that's, you know, there has to be some sort of system for, as you're saying, public involvement that isn't just the developer coming in and asking for the change. Um, and there's a very important issue that's, that's um, at stake here, which is value. I mean, enormous, in some cases, enormous amounts of money are generated by zoning or, or taken away mm -hmm. um, as well. And so there's, a, there's an interesting, um, I mean, there's a thorny political aspect to that. Just one um, quick thing to throw into the mix. Zoning is political and it changes over time, and I, I guess I just described that. Um, I discovered in a small town in Florida that if you want to make it really hard to change something that is near and dear to the community, as height is in Lauderdale-by-the-Sea, do not put it in the zoning code, put it in the city charter because then you have to have a public referendum to change it. I also would like to add to this that um, we should remain, as new urbanists, we should remain master tacticians. And if we're not invited to ride in town a white horse, which happens occasionally through an RFP process led by a person that believes that this can happen, I think we should be ready to enter through the back door in the dark of night. And there's a wonderful example of this in the work that, pardon me? Uh, or sneak out if necessary, but uh, I would like to suggest, for instance, that an excellent example of this is the work that, that uh, you've been doing in, uh, in El Paso, Susan, uh, placemakers in Dover Coal, where actually the process has, has started really 
very informally and very opportunistically and went from small to bigger to biggest and it's not over yet. So uh, we cannot be in a situation where we make the, you know, the, the good, the enemy of the unbelievably polished. I, uh, the, the, we, we need to operate as we can, I think, and continue to do this for a long time to come. Let me say a few things about the transportation half of the land use transportation issue uh, couplet that we're always wrestling with. Um, Peter Norton, if you didn't hear him yesterday, you will hear more of him. I've said that he's given his first of 12 presentations to future congresses of the new urbanism. He's a historian that, uh, that documented in great detail 1900 to 1940 when we went from walking to driving. And all the players that, that took That's us that 40 way. years again. That 40 year it's number keeps coming It's a tremendous, back. tremendous book that he's written, uh, Fighting Traffic. But um, he, uh, he described that there were really two waves of traffic engineers. The first traffic engineers wanted to do traffic control, which kept the urban form the way it was. The second wave, after motordom, automobile interests, took over, they said, uh, let's get these cities modified so the automobiles can flow right in and we can sell them and maintain them and everything else. And that, that was the destruction of the urban form, the second traffic engineering group. They came in, they were invited in from the country. They had just built highways, they had paved the dirt roads between cities. They were heroes. So they were invited into the cities and they were invited to do the same thing. That's why we have departments of roadway design instead of street design, because they came in from the country. So what I need out of a code as, as an engineer, so I can turn around and speak to all the engineers I deal with, I need something that tells me specifically that a cross-section for one mile of, of urban street changes four times. The road designers in the country are used to doing five or six miles with the same cross-section. No change. Just Put it in there like it's a public utility. That's why they look so ugly. They're utilities. So I need a code that says we have a T6 or a T4 or a T3. And, and now universally around the United States, we're able to say, you know, I have a problem with my T4 and the parallel parking going to angle parking in the T4. And, and thousands of people know what you mean when you say that inside our profession. So I need a code that, that is specific enough as you vary within one neighborhood to inform the design about parking, about trees, about speed, curb radii, all of those critical design issues. Because right now the engineers are clueless on this. They just consider it to be one uniform project for one, two, three miles. So perhaps it would be worth pointing out that in, the, uh, in producing Miami 21, um, in fact, we did do public work standards for streets according to T-Zone, um, and it was Chapter 8, I believe, um, which remained in the draft of the code for a long time, um, vetted by the Public Works Department, um, small changes to make it acceptable to them, um, until the point they realized they'd have to go to public hearing if they wanted to do something different. Yeah. Um, and then it came out of the code. Um, but I wonder if Anna would want to say anything to weigh in on this discussion since she's had the initiating experience. Well, as, as, it, as it relates, um, and I wanted to say two things, and I would help because I was part of the jury, but obviously Miami 21 keeps coming back. Um, so I'll answer your question and then I'll get the hat of the planning director, former planning director. Um, as far as the public works, it was a battle uh, because it was very difficult. It was a, a matter of territories and jurisdiction, and uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't step into someone else's jurisdiction. At that time, I frankly, um, those who have worked with me, to me, wasn't part of being on the limelight or being the person. So I gracefully, I said, you know, if the public works director wants the authority to sign the permits, I'm okay with it, as long as they do follow the transects that we had done. So what we had was it was, it is an article eight. It is as a, uh, it's, it shows what it should be, but it actually is being worked on the public works 
under the Public Works Department, so they are absorbing it, so they will be using them. The difference was, according to our laws, and I'm sure same with you, um, for us, any change has to have a public hearing, or it had a public hearing, and people got a little bit nervous about it. The Public Works Director wanted to be able to sign off without a public hearing. To me, a public hearing versus a not a public hearing, it was okay as long as they follow what the transit was. So it was kind of who takes the credit for that. And I was, I would rather, you know, it's kind of like I'd rather have the baby, have the transit, have the regulations, and have someone else have the pleasure of signing off on permits with better streets. Um, and that's how, that's how it was done, but many times, and you know, teams smiling because that is what it is. You know, you have to get along with a bunch of other directors and somehow make sure that you don't lose sight of what the goal is, and that's what we had to do for five years. Um, and as far as the code itself, and sometimes, and I have heard discussion of what and if the municipalities may not have the funding, um, and I'm not sure who here in the audience is a planner or works for a municipality, I think sometimes it's, uh, the planners know you know, you actually have to believe that the people that are working in the municipality know what the community has. And sometimes we know what, what it is. Sometimes we have done plans and they have been put on a shelf and that's why we want something that is implementable. So sometimes the, the, the people do know what it is that you need to go. So we can go, it's not that you jump right into a zoning code and one size fits all. What it is, you have a clear knowledge of what it is that your community needs and you know what the problems are and that's why I think in our case, it was a hybrid. We couldn't just take it from the shelf and put it down because it was impossible. It was, you know, close to 37 square miles of a city with three very diverse groups. Um, but it was, um, we always were proud to say that it was a, not only land development regulations, but it was also a planning document. We changed things that we knew if we would have done a plan, that's where, the, you know, where things had to change. We just used the implementation tool of what was the zoning code. So it was, you know, there are many ways to do it. Every community is different. In the case of Miami, it was really a hybrid. Um, but I would hate to think that is, you know, that it would stop anyone from trying to do it because of funding. Because there, even if you get a little bit, it is more than what you had before. And that's the beginning. And, you know, and it will change and it will evolve. Anyway, that being said, I get my planning hat off. <laughs> and I return this back to Emily. So, Steph, what I think was just described in our last two questioners um, or commenters was a certain universal language being developed and the value of that as a way of expediting, as a way of uh, getting people to, you know, talk to each other. Do you have any response about that? Or I'm sort of picking on you, but, yeah. That's fine. I, I, I spoke about the... I spoke very clearly about my admiration for for a common la for for the for the attempt of developing a common language uh, in, 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 in a kind of encyclopedic level DNA uh, that that covers urbanism to the greatest extent to the most expansive extent. But I also I think spoke very clearly about what I think are potential da dangers of imposing that as a normative condition on on uh, on uh, people who don't have perhaps the insight to understand how to use it properly. It's a very difficult and a very complicated tool. And uh, I, I, I mean, I've said it five different ways. Yeah. Uh, and our, our codes are transit-based codes. I think many other people's codes are transit-based codes. And they owe an awful lot to, to, to the smart code. I mean, we look at the smart code um, regularly in our work. but we don't treat it as a brand and we don't use it uh, uncritically. Not that anybody else uses it uncritically, but we make a point of not using it literally, I should say, not uncritically. We never use it literally. That's, that's a much clearer way of saying it. Yeah. Susan. Susan Henderson, um, and just responding to what has seemed to be a universal critique, beginning with Dan yesterday, um, we do extensive work with Smart Code and I think we're all in that community mortified um, three years ago when Kona Hawaii adopted the code off the shelf and no one knew anything about it and they didn't understand any need of calibration and so you know when we go and visit and we see the 10 to 10 to 20 percent grades that they're dealing with and you know what that needs how what the demands of that for calibration and 
their traditional planning methods of the Ahupua'a and the, you know, the Polynesian influence and all of these things that make that such an amazingly character-rich place, then, you know, philosophically we're mortified. But my question for you both, for you all, is which is worse? I mean, we, we, we calibrated their code, but which is worse? Um, an off-the-shelf, uncalibrated smart code, are there existing Euclidean document that was importing Los Angeles sprawl? Which is worse? It's often a choice. Well, I, I can speak to that a little bit. I think one of the things we're underscoring here is the importance of language. And if we insist on calling something a smart code or insist on using the transect language, we really kind of doom ourselves to not having many communities even want to look at adopting this type of philosophy of zoning. In the environment in which I practice planning, it's a place that isn't very open to things like smart growth or smart codes or even sustainability in some cases. It's very much a, a property rights kind of place and people I think don't even realize that there's already zoning on their property and that there are already rules that they have to operate within. And so that when you go to rezone, it's all of a sudden that now you're imposing something on them that didn't exist before. So as we went through this exercise, although, as Stefano said, this is a, it's a code that's utterly informed by the, by the smart code concept, we had to look at the language that we used in order for it to be acceptable. And we did use language that was descriptive of the places that we were trying to create or that already existed but had been damaged and we wanted to reinforce that this was the place that we were trying to create. And when we hired Mole and Polyzoides, we weren't actually going out specifically for a firm that specialized in form-based codes or smart codes. We were actually being driven by our redevelopment agency that wanted us to create zoning specifically for a development project they were working on. And we had to say, no, we need to broaden this and this is our opportunity now to go back and look at this area. And what we were interested in was building form over building use. And what we were able to do successfully, and I think where emphasizing the language of smart codes, we would not have been as successful, was trying to say, you know what? This really isn't any different from the zone you have now. We already regulate building envelopes. We already have some level of design standards. Really what this is doing is saying you have more flexibility over use now and uh, we're going to look a little bit more at the form because what we have is ugly. So trying to boil it down into those types of terms that people can understand and embrace is I think something that we really have to emphasize. So it's getting late, just two more questions I think. Not a question, uh, my name is Rick Geller. I just wanted to make all of you aware, uh, those of you who are writing form-based codes in the state of Florida, that you have a powerful new tool in dealing with uh, the public's works departments, transportation planning departments, uh, your colleagues there. Uh, this coming Monday, a new Florida Green Book chapter called Traditional Neighborhood Development goes into effect, and a lot of that has to do with Rick Hall back there. So thanks a lot, Rick. One last question here. Comment. Comment. Actually, responding to one of your uh, questions earlier, oh, okay. uh, Tony Perez, the, the question was early on about uh, why the Santa Ana Code and codes like that um, regulate building types and, and why do they regulate them in the way they do. A uh, short answer is it's, it's a way to recognize on the terms of that neighborhood, that place, and, and that part of the world what is making that place at an individual scale, in an individual lot scale. Uh, what is making that block? And so you could make that abstract and say, well, the pattern of the buildings is X by Y by Z. But in order to recognize how people are already living there and how, what is making that place, 
those three dimensions and how people are using it, that's where we focus in on building type. It's already a, a tradition, already a pattern, and it, we're either reviving it and revealing it to them uh, and, and adjusting it or learning from it completely. Um, the other reason is just simply pragmatics. I, I was pull, pulling up a slide to show you, but um, it's a great street in Berkeley, and uh, the pattern is little Victorian houses, and then sometime in the 70s somebody rezoned it without any understanding of building type or building size, let alone. And so they conform to building envelope and setbacks. And so it meets all of those parameters. But if you look down the side, it's a cruise ship next to little houses that are wonderful. And so you could say, well, we could do that with building length parameters. You could, but if building patterns are already there through building types, why not use that? I also want to, to, to respond to the question of uh, whether an uncalibrated code is better than, um, than conventional zoning. There are many ways you can damage your health. You can do it by eating McDonald's every day, or you can do it by eating sashimi every day for 40 years. Uh, and the fact is that I think uh, there is no difference between an uncalibrated smart code imposed on Kona and a bad use-based use, uh, uh, use, uh, code imposed on Kona. I think it is our responsibility, I'll say this another time again, it's our moral responsibility to make absolutely sure that people understand that an uncalibrated normative smart code is not a useful instrument by itself. It is a matrix for answering questions, for posing questions, excuse me. It's an instrument for posing questions, not an operative system for actually executing uh, a kind of town in your town if you don't know that, that what the code is about and your town are compatible at all. I, I, I'm, of that, I'm, I'm pretty certain. And, uh, and uh, I think that, that the richness of our, of, of our, of our city form, and, and Kona is, is a very undistinguished city by an extraordinary nature. Uh, I think it is important to think about ways of not promoting this instrument as being uncritically useful to anybody. It has to be understood as an applied instrument, not as an abstract thing that you can buy off the shelf and use it. That, I think, is your responsibility as smart coders to actually tell the world, it seems to me. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And I, I was sensitive to what you said about the, just the brand of it, the title of it is a problem. Um, and. That's something that I think the new urbanists have dealt with since the beginning, is almost any time we've called anything, anything, somebody's there to say, you know, we don't want it. Um, and, but there are principles involved that have not had that problem. And, um, and I think that's perhaps what we might take away from this, is that the idea that there is a structure across density in the city, which can be evolved in a regulatory fashion that's based on the transect, um, for instance, is probably more palatable than something that has that brand. The T&D had the same problem, um, and in some cases TOD, probably less so. But, and so I think in the end it's, it is about, in a sense, what Steph is saying. It's about place-specific. Um, corrections, but I think that we also need to acknowledge that um, everybody uses some sort of beginning point, and that's what the old codes, um, the Euclidean codes evolved into. You bought it from the code council, and then everybody was tailoring it to their community, and it happened to be a suburban, a suburban model. This is perhaps the first model that's been presented that um, attempts to make urbanism at some scale, at some density, or some range of densities that brings, you know, eliminates the parking lot in front and worries about the sidewalk and the street out front. And then, so in that sense, it is a starting point. Um, and I think most people understand that it can be used in that way. Hopefully. Liz, do you want to respond um, to the, this issue of building types that was brought up and how the smart code doesn't really handle building type the way the Santa Ana code does? Um, I don't know if that's a why question. I guess it is it, in Miami, right, Liz? You, you use 
seriously use building, code, building types in Miami? No, it's really, um, Miami has such a variety of building types, it was really about the street wall. And um, I think that building type in the manner that it was described um, is appropriate for places where there's a very clear picture of what that might be. Um, so when there is a historic building type or, um, uh, and maybe it's even separation of building type, that would make sense. Um, I'm thinking of the old dingbat mm -hmm. codes that I think Dan developed years ago. Um, but in, a, in many cities, there's so many different, there is such a mix already that it would be perceived as too restrictive to say, you must do a townhouse here. And when you're all your, when, the, when it's already huge to try to achieve a street wall instead of a parking lot. Well, I, I want to clarify this because it's a hugely important issue. Uh, if you look at every American city, um, they're made up of a very limited menu of types, probably anywhere from 10 to 15, which are probably the total number of types is probably 15 probably, if, if you, depending how you, you count them and how you measure them. And um, I think the important issue here is that when you erase FAR as a, as a measurement or a metric of, of entitlement, already you've done something, we've done something absolutely revolutionary. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to tell that this very contorted and distorting instrument of urbanism is being taken away. And I don't think you can replace FAR with street walls because you're leaving the entire issue of block formation up, up to, to chance. And, I, and, and the alternative is not, it seems to me, is not to, uh, is, is not to do a fixed master plan in which you demand one type for each lot, but to actually allow for a fairly wide range of types per zone. And I think at that particular point, you, you have given architecture tremendous leeway because people are not held to minuscule issues of height or extraordinary questions of, 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 of width and the usual things about shoehorning buildings in the city. And you are pu putting into place a typological structure that allows buildings to be built next to each other which are compatible a priori from the start. And it, it is to some extent more, a more constricting attitude than just allowing for street walls alone but I think it begins to talk about the necessity to both establish the city properly and grow the city pro pro uh, pro uh, pro uh, well because this type should be compatible and be able to, to be pulled next to each other with some degree of order, as in the case, for instance, of high-rise buildings having bases, something as simple as that, to establish the four or five. I, I, I think... It's 5.15. Well, let's have one more. And then we'll oh, okay. Well, then, Jeff, hurry up. It sounds weak, but I, Steph, I think, this is a, I think this is a question for next time because I agree with Liz, although I'd put it differently. I, I, think, uh, I think there are some problems. We, we, in our codes, we don't use building type. And I think, but I think building type, understanding a building type is crucial to, to making the city. But I find, and maybe if I worked in California, I would disagree. But I, it's about the level of government regulation. And so our codes demand a, a certain performance to the street, a performance to the civic realm, the public realm, which would allow a variety of building types behind it, but the conception of the public space comes first. And how, is the, how are the buildings regulated? Are they regulated by FAR in your codes? Height, how, how do you know how big a building it is? Height, and how siding, elements, function. But, and it's, it's 515, but I... But, but in effect, it's, not just it's, one it's way. the formal equivalent of FAR because no. you're, you're, you're getting, you're in, in the moment no. in which you're dealing with, with envelopes, you're dealing with blobs. One, one, of the, one of the issues that we run into, though, is that you have to be able to justify it by the enabling legislation of 
um, access to uh, public health, safety, and welfare. And that's not really something that you can defend in building types. Now, I think it's something we can achieve through other means, such as um, you know, requiring yards or these other elements in their placement. So we can achieve the same thing, but it's really hard in municipal codes to do that. In, in our private codes, we use building types absolutely, but in our municipal codes, we don't use them. Carol, can I just respond to, to what uh, they're both saying? So the, to make it very clear, when we, when we talk about the building types for a particular zone, and, and by the way, I, did the, I just checked the Santa Ana uh, code that we did some years ago. There are four ped sheds. One of them is, is actually, it shouldn't be a ped shed, but it's got one mapped on it. It's a special district. It's a government center that we couldn't affect or control um, for a bunch of homeland security reasons. The other three ped sheds have at least three z zones, which are these you know, intensity-based, uh, transect-based zones in them. So just for the scorecard there, if you're keeping score on that. That was the question, I think, early on. The building types, each of those zones receives a range of building types. So n no zone is one, one building type specific. It always has a range of types, both, as I like to describe it, for what's going on that you like now, what could happen in the future at, a, at some, some point over here at the end of the spectrum, and what could happen in the future at this other end of the spectrum. So you bracket what's going on now in terms of the intended change. So every zone has a range of types, and the types are something, as Karen was saying, when they explain it to people, they're already regulating them. They're already regulating the volume. The, 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 the types help developers in another way. They help the public in another way. Most importantly, they help neighbors and, com and compatible. When, when planners talk about compatibility, land use compatibility, one of the easiest ways to do that is through building types that can be adjacent to one another. And, and revealing those through code like this is, is very, very helpful, if not controversial. Thank you so much. Let's give a real hand to Stephanos and Liz.